Today's episode of Darkness Radio's True Crime Tuesday is brought to you by Babbel. You can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash darkness. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Welcome into the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm Tim Dennis. Boy, have I got a treat for you guys today. You know, we had talked uh, not not too many episodes ago. I'm, I don't remember the exact amount of episodes ago about the last Jewish gangster. We talked about book one of three. We have a treat for you today. We have book two of three and one of our favorite uh, guests here on the program. David Larson is back. You know, I started to dig into this book this weekend while I was at Michigan Paracon. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, all hell and high water broke loose on the uh, last day that I was in Michigan. I'll tell you guys about it later uh, on Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals with Beer City Bruiser. Um, and I was telling David about it uh, before we got to air here. Um, I, the only solace I had on the last day I was in Michigan is that I had this book in my hand. Otherwise... I think uh, my entire day would have been a disaster reincarnated. Not the disaster that Michael Hardy goes through, however, uh, in his life. But at least I had the solace that my life was a little bit better than Michael Hardy's. And we will discuss that in this uh, first part of the program. Uh, David Larson, as you know, I, I don't necessarily have to go through his bio yet, yet again, but... Uh, David Larson's been a favorite to this program since his first appearance. I know you guys had a great time listening the last time to uh, David Larson. Let's bring him in now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let's bring into the, the True Crime Tuesday here, uh, author David Larson. David, thank you so much for joining us yet again here on True Crime Tuesday. Tim, I always feel very welcome to be a part of the show. Well, I, I'm so happy you're back with us. I had such a good time talking to you last time. I, I, uh, I didn't want to, I wanted to skip the bio, not, no disrespect to you, uh, but because uh, we have so much to talk about, my friend, you know, uh, and, you know, breaking into this book was, was almost like getting back to an old friend and, and finding out more about an old friend that you go, you know what, boy, is he a load of trouble, but you, you just can't help wanting to peer in and seeing what kind of trouble he was. It's kind of that titillation you get from knowing that you have a bad boy around the corner uh, that you you love to talk to. He's great to sit down at a diner with and get to know, but you really don't want to hang out with him because you know you're going to be involved in something really shady. Um, when we last left Michael, he was in he was in a Mexican prison called the Devil's Table, and it was not going to be a fun adventure. Uh, and that was at the end of the last Jewish gang gangster book one. Um, it opens up and we're, we're getting introduced to Michael being booked into the devil's table. Uh, take us through a, just a short walkthrough of what happens when he realizes he's there and his mother is there with him. And he knows that he's probably going to be the only one to survive this outcome. Yeah. Um, his, his mother and him both went in. Uh, she was, it was more formality for her. Mm -hmm. because she was going to be released a day later because he promised, uh, well, he promised her that he would take the rap for a counterfeiting operation. She got $4,000 worth of bad $10 bills that they tried to pass at Caliente racetrack in Tijuana and they were arrested there. And, uh, she begged him, I'll do anything. I'll come visit you every day. I can't do the time because the, uh, time that they were talking about is 12 years. Ooh. And and so he was again, as much as he hated his mother, he was trying to do anything to win her approval or love. So he said he'd do the time. Secret Service came in, uh, part of the part of the federal federal government, the Treasury Department, and questioned him. 
you know, everyone. And they, they finally left because Hardy wouldn't tell him anything and said, well, if he ever gets out or he dies, let us know. Oh, so that's, that's where he ends up going to this prison. He's searched by the commandante strip search and everything. And then he's taken to, uh, to, uh, let's call the tank. They had tank where they have hundreds of prisoners and he's put in a cell with a, um, sailor. Now he's, he's given choices right now when he walks into the prison, if I understand this right, he's given some money. It's only like $4, isn't it? That's, that's all he has left. He, he's, he gives the commandante the, all the money he has in the commandante gives him back. He, I think he gave him like 60 bucks or something. Okay. He had his, his boot. The commandante gets him back four crumpled ones. Oh, jeez. And he doesn't know, doesn't know the language, doesn't know how, how anything works. He'd been in plenty of prisons and jails in the U.S. already. But this is just, um, he's seat of the pants trying to figure out how everything works. And when he's finally dumped in the cell with this uh, sailor from the U.S., uh, sailor gives him a little rundown. And 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 half an hour left at, later after they after they met, as they're talking in their in their little cell, um, a man calls shows up called Wilkinson, and he opens his coat and he's able Hardy's able to buy a knife, choose whatever kind of knife he wants, and costs him a buck. So that goes there goes twenty five percent of the money he has. Right. Yeah. And he doesn't really notice know yet what it costs to take a shower, to buy a meal. They give you rice and beans, but that's it for a meal. And they have restaurants in this prison. It's very. It was considered the most entrepreneurial prison in the world. There was a special report done on it, it was released in 1969, and it talked about how you could open up a restaurant, you could up a shoe repair, you could do all kinds of things, jewelry store if you wanted to. And, you had to give kickbacks, of course, to the commandante. But right, and and the one thing that you you stress in the book that I think a lot of people don't realize is that the Mexican jail doesn't necessarily feed you. No, they give you just a tortilla and beans and rice. If you want some, anything more than that, you have to pay. If you want to get a work detail every day, 50 cents to get a work detail. So that $4 just started disappearing right away. Mm. So Michael, which by the way, he's not being called Michael at this point. He's decided to take a new name so that he's not easily recognized. Richard Mandel, uh, right. he goes by an alias. It, it's a close friend of his that he grew up with, um, who's that was the name of his brother, younger brother that died in an accident. So he assumed that name. So he's known as Richard, you know, Richard Mandel. And that's how he's operating at the time. He, he shows about uh, 10 different aliases along the way during his lifetime. Which when you have six different agencies after you, you have to choose a different name. I mean, you can't necessarily flaunt Michael Hardy for very long. Uh, so he's he's uh, he's treading water lightly because he's getting to know this the system around the devil's table, which is very complex. I mean, he's so this, the sailor's kind of giving him the, the lay of the land and, and he's learning that. He finds his favorite cafe. He finds a favorite cafe. He knows that he can he can get a little bit of of uh, food at at one place. Um, he's learning that there are not only just legal trade and tender that he can do in there, but he's learning there's a little bit of illegal trade and tender as well. Tell us a little bit about the illegal trade and tender of the land there uh, at the Devil's Table. Well, so much of it is surrounding drugs. And uh, oh, although there was a chop shop they had operating in the back of this prison for a while where they take stolen cars, they bring them in the prison, they tear them apart for parts, they rebuild them and sell them across the border, the U.S. But most of it was uh, guns or drugs. Mm. And uh, uh, Hardy was tasked with the 25 Americans to be able to sell them drugs and collect but he was brought in for other occasions to uh, help out and uh, with some of the other prisoners that were coming through. That was one of the murders he committed inside uh, where he, they went and collect about $400 owed by one of the Mexican prisoners. Mm -hmm. And he was handed a gun by Patricio. By the way, Patricio, 
was a gay drug lord, which, <laughs> which, which is really interesting because Hardy, Hardy didn't have any trouble with him just so long as the guy didn't approach him. Sure. But, but he, he was just thinking to himself, there's nowhere in New York with all the people he worked with in, uh, in the mafia and, um, and street dealers and everything would had anyone announced or been known to be gay, they would have been taken out. Yeah. Well, but it, here it was just natural. It was okay. And I, and I don't say that very cavalier or laissez faire. Um, I, it's just, as you put it, that was the culture. Uh, if you were to come out and announce you were gay, you were dead. It's yeah. just on the street. That was just the way it was. But it didn't seem to be that big of a deal inside the devil's table. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. The um, uh, when Patricio was brought in, they brought in a lot of uh, relatives and his sister was one of them. They arrested not only him, but family members, which is just and no trials. They just sent him to the prison. Um, and the sister opened up a nice, real nice restaurant in there. So he went over there eat all the time. And Patricia started building all these suites and all these uh, apartments. And there were, there were trucks full of uh, cement coming in all, all day long. And they were just building, he built himself a big suite on the second floor. You could see the, the town of Tijuana in the, in the distance and big plaza up there where he'd host a lot of parties. Every weekend was a big party. Wow. And bowls of co cocaine being passed around just, there was no something he'd give kickbacks to the commandante. I mean, he could have hired an army that could have busted him out, but it, they just, everyone understood the rules. Yeah. He'd been caught. He was in there because he took a machine gun to a Cuban competitor and cut him in half on a Tijuana street. So, okay. You caught me. Okay. I'll go do my time, but he'll live the way he wanted to in there. That's crazy. And be, and because he was gay, he would hire these boys that would come in on the weekends or these little mandaleros they would call that would do run errands and stuff. And sometimes they get friendly and take care of Patricio and he would pay him accordingly. And wow. But then he would, he would provide uh, hookers mm -hmm. for, for a lot of the, for the other people uh, in prison that would come there and uh, on weekends when they party and, He'd it take, was just uh, parties. It was just, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was as unlike any place he could have been gone to a foreign planet somewhere and still had to figure everything out that was going on there because nothing made sense. There's a, there's a scene in the book that is absolutely, it's chilling to think of, but he's, he, he's wanting to get rid of a, a, a rival for I, I, it's just a, a very mundane reason. I, I don't even remember the reason, but they're having one of these lavish parties you're talking about where there's bowls of cocaine and they're trying to they're trying to warn Richard or, or Michael at the time right. not to, 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 you know, dip your nose into this bowl, uh, but they can't say it. You know, but they, they couldn't warn him ahead of time. They couldn't say, you know, you know, as they're passing this bowl around. Uh, so this this rival they're trying to get rid of, you know, pretty much dips himself into the bowl, takes a nice big snort, you know, gets a snoot full. And uh, it's time for Richard to get the, the bowl to him. And uh, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, they're, they're trying to, you know, wave him off. And so the guy tips his head back and all of a sudden, Boom, head hits the table. And it was like, oh, that's why. Um, so basically they kill him by poisoning him. Oh yeah. And 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 it's like, okay, party back on, you know, just very Roman like, you know. It's it's yeah. uh, you know, party on, Wayne, here we go. And it's just like, wow, you could have took him out in any way. There's guns everywhere, there's knives everywhere. You could have had one of your guys walk up and just break his neck. But you chose to take him out in a very peaceful, ironic way, lure him in, relax him, kill him with a, a very ironic way of party till you die. And uh, that was it was important that uh, Patricio did that in front of a lot of his competitors, too, because he brought in all of them. Yeah. People that would sell. They saw this happen. 
So they understood what the rules were. I mean, Hardy was just he his wife came out from Brooklyn to visit him mm-hmm. uh, and she uh, she stayed for a while with her aunt in, in San Diego and would come down and visit him. And one time she came there and she just didn't like the way people. Uh, the the prisoners who whistled at her and everything felt very self conscious walking across the yard, but she was sitting in El Griego's this Greek restaurant, uh, having lunch with him, and someone walks past him, pulls out a gun and empties it into somebody at the table next to him, blood splattering all over them, mm. and he takes her, t- you know, he gets her out of there as soon as possible, but she's just she's just a mess and she never goes back to the pr- prison to visit him again. Yeah. In fact, she, she goes back to, um, to Brooklyn and he ends up writing her the, the letter. It's just like, Hey, don't know if I'll ever get out of here. You know, find yourself a better guy. It was one of the most unselfish things he did because he was a pretty selfish guy. Well, unselfish, but it ends up being one of the biggest mistakes of his life, isn't it? I oh mean, yeah. One of the biggest regrets. Yeah. Well, she ends up hooking up with with a crooked cop uh, in New York <laughs> that uh, that ends up uh, and uh, being his girlfriend. He's married, and th- this guy takes care of him. So uh, takes care of her. So yeah. uh, Hardy comes back out of prison. He's just kind of he can't go visit her because she's dating a cop. He can't be known. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, he shows up on the scene and what do you do? You know, I mean, you're, you, you've announced yourself and then, and then it's on, the chase is on. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's confusing to him, I think, because no matter who enters his life as a love interest or, or even just an accomplice to keep him busy for now, I'll put it like that in a nice way. Um, there's still that burning love for Sheila. And I think, you know, we all have these, these times in life, David, where uh, I think we romanticize that time in life. And I think in the, in the time where he was coming up and things were, were sweet in his life, Sheila was part of that. And I think part of that is he's holding on to older, better times. I don't know that things were necessarily great with Sheila, but he remembers a better time in life when things were yeah. better and, you know, things have never been as good as that time in his life. Yeah, pretty much that way. Uh, he tried to grasp onto something like that at other times. And, um, th- there was an innocence there when he got out of, um, military in the first book, he, um, he, he was kicked out basically mm-hmm. when a wall, then he wrote a letter to JFK that mm-hmm. said, uh, um, yeah, they're mistreating me as a Jew, you know, and they, uh, broke the chain of command. Of course, uh, when he gets out of prison, he ends up meeting her not too long, not too much later. Yeah. And, um, uh, he takes a trip on their honeymoon, goes to Washington, DC, gets a a meeting at the pentagon he wants to try and clear up his name try there's a even though he got an eagle tattoo on his left forearm he he kind of because he was supposed to be a paratrooper Mm -hmm. that he screwed that up you know he's looking for some salvation and they just shut him down yeah so he's just he carried that she went through a lot of that with him yeah had two had two children with her um but, uh, you know, they're he kept on getting into situations like prison time where he and law going after him where he just couldn't. He, um, he even took off for Israel. We was gone for almost six months. He's Let, let's talk a little bit about that, because uh, that that's kind of the interesting transition between the devil's table and, you know, he comes back from the devil's table and he tries to settle back in. A little bit with family um you know he's he's got his uncle morty who's only really a, what 10 years older than he is 11 um, yeah 11 and he finds out even though morty comes down to mexico and kind of puts money in the coffers to 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 keep him going uh he finds out that his aunt really was the one who was was keeping him going while he was down there and you get the feeling that maybe there's a little bit of shame there um, that really it was auntie who was looking after him. He thought maybe it was Morty and there was maybe a little less guilt behind that. And he thought maybe his mother was even feeding the mother money right. to Morty. Right. 
Yeah. And it wasn't mother. Mother really didn't care. Mother got yeah. off scot free and mother didn't feel any remorse whatsoever. Um, and so there is a little bit of, uh, how would you describe it? Shame? Is that how you describe it on his part? Yeah, uh, it, it was, It was, but uh, confused. It was confused shame. I mean, he first time, the second time he tried to commit suicide was right after he got out of Mexican prison. He moves back to Brooklyn. He's hanging out his mother mother's apartment. Uh, it's a it's a rainy day. He's eating cottage cheese, watching TV. Mm -hmm. And she goes to the fridge. Where's my cottage cheese? You know, mm -hmm. and he she she she's so mad. She slams the door and goes out. And he tell calls him a pig. Once you wash up because he hadn't taken a shower in three days. <laughs> so he's on his way to the bathroom. And instead he goes to the closet, reaches up where this 25 is. 25 star, this gun mm -hmm. Patricio gave him, he goes back, sits down on the couch, says his quick little goodbyes to everybody, puts the gun to his chest, pulls the trigger, click. Takes the gun apart. He's so pissed off, slaps it again, makes sure the bolt chamber tries it again, click. The firing pit was all screwed up, <laughs> um, but it was a wake up call. He was ready to end his life. Of course. Now, and uh, he goes and gets a job at construction company now, starts. If I can, David, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Let me, let me interrupt you real quick. Most people in that situation would hear that click twice, check the firing pin and go, you know what? This is either a message message from God saying, this isn't my time. Um, and maybe I should look at this a little different. Maybe I should change my outlook in life. Or they would do what Michael did and say, well, GD it, you know, <laughs> you know, what the hell's going on here? I'm trying to take myself out. And he got frustrated and just decided, well, I guess I got to move on with this and just continue the same old patterns. Isn't that essentially well, what he, he did? He got, he got a job in construction. Okay. He had to get paid under the table. So right. it wasn't crime. And then he gets in an accident, falls off the scaffolding, hurts his back. And then somebody Morty knows, some lawyer comes, comes rushing around. And Hardy was, you know, false two stories, but he, yeah, he's a little sore, but they put him in the hospital. Now he's got to work him his comp going on. There's a lawsuit going on against a construction company. And this working, you know, six to three, six to three every day and humping bricks and stuff uh all of a sudden he's in the hospital it's looking pretty good lawyers uh and a doctor comes in and uh gives him a diagnosis that makes sure he gets on workman's comp so all of a sudden he's on workman's comp doesn't have to work he hooks up an old friend and starts falling into a life of crime Let's uh, let's do this, David. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, sure. let's talk about getting into that life of crime. But I, I want to talk too about the journey to Tel Aviv and what changed Michael's mind and to get back to being Richard Mandel and why the change? Why? What was it about finding out that his aunt was was funding the the Devil's Table existence? What was it that got to him so deeply, and why did he decide? that looking at that star on his chest made him decide that, you know what, I need to be a little bit better Jew and, and get to the, the heart of things. Was it, was it just divine intervention standing at a train station and deciding I'm going to Tel Aviv or was it something deeper? We'll, we'll dis discuss that when we come back. Uh, David Larson is our guest. He's the author of The Last Jewish Gangster. This is book two of three, folks. Yes, there is going to be a book three, and David's working on it right now. When we come back, we'll talk about why Michael Hardy decided to jump back into being Richard Mandel and uh, take that trip to Tel Aviv. Michael Hardy, does he stay on the straight and narrow, or does he get into the same old trap of knocking over drug dealers, Stolen cars and murder. We'll find out more with our guest, David Larson. It's coming up next here on the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday.
Welcome back to the Best in True Crime Podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm Tim Dennis. Our guest is David Larson. The book is The Last Jewish Gangster. This is book two of three that we're talking about. And we are smack dab in the middle of talking about Michael Hardy, a.k.a. Richard Mandel. Uh, before the break, David, we were talking about how Richard Mandel is is um, now at this point where he's worked the construction job. Uh, he's been hurt. They've even given him last rights. And when they were giving him last rights, they... He woke up and he went, wait a minute, what are you doing? There's a Catholic priest standing over him and he pulls a star off of his chest, the star of David, and goes, you got the wrong guy. Um, and it was at that point, uh, I think he, you know, he he realized, too, uh, as we're, we're about to get into that, um, you, you said he, he started to turn to a life of crime again. Um, so he gets into this life of crime and tell me what it is. Uh, before he decides to go to Tel Aviv, what did, what is it that he decides to get into as far as a life of crime? Well, he starts working with the buddy, his, his childhood buddy, buddy. Uh, and they uh, they're running uh, they're working a number of scams at the thieves market. Mm -hmm. uh, Hardy Hardy goes to work uh, providing some kind of um, uh, security for a um, uh, fur coat company. He starts some of the stuff starts exiting the back door <laughs> and he's helping that out. Um, he uh, he uh, he works for a record company uh, for a while and they're just duplicating posters and and uh, spinning off records and stuff and selling all those there. It's just a little petty stuff. Then he starts robbing drug drug dealers posing as a cop. Hmm. And you could go to this Connecticut badge company or the uh, uh, supply company that supplies all the police there. Mm -hmm. And he just order a badge and uniforms and stuff. So he just did that. So he could just flash a badge like he was undercover. Uh, he got a hold of a, a book that uh, listed a bunch of drug dealers and their addresses and just started going after him one after another with a buddy of his. is knocking him off. It's not like these guys were going to complain. So he'd take their money. And they're in their drugs and they sold most of it to uh, the manager, a lot of it to the manager of Anthony and the Imperials. Really? They, uh, yeah. <laughs> a soul group. Uh, he got involved in a, oh, some some uh, some guy decided to keep his son uh, uh, because somebody was uh, uh, taking advantage of his wife. And this guy was a small time drug dealer mm -hmm. and Hardy managed to come to his apartment and uh, had had someone else knock on his door, look out the peephole. And as soon as he opened it, he knocked it down. He put a put a bullet in this guy's in the middle of his chest. Oh, and um, the because he was he kidnapped his son. He kept was keeping his son there until the until he found out who was screwing the guy, his the guy's wife. Jeez. And uh so this guy had smoke cigarette dangling out of his mouth. He hardly kicked the gun away that he had. Mm -hmm. And as he was talking, little puffs of smoke were coming out of the hole in his chest. Oh. It was really, really gnarly. <laughs> really gnarly. Oh, my God. So he did go on the lam for a while. Uh, what drove him to um, uh, to go to, to get out of town, it was July 4th. A lot of things happened on July 4th in his life. Yeah. And this is another July 4th. Um, he had been pulled over and he was riding with someone. He had some weed in his car. It's no big deal now, but back then they put you away. Oh yeah. And so he got pulled over. He got, he got pinched for the weed. He gave him the, the, the fake name of Richard Mandel and they got him out on bail. Uh, he got out and, uh, he sold his motorcycle and some other stuff to his good friend. And he got a ticket to go to on uh, a Slavnik air to head over to Stuttgart, Germany. Didn't know any, anything of where he was going to go. Mm -hmm. Just get the heck out. And he lands there and he gets to this train station. He's looking at all the tiles flicking, clacking around of different places that he'd only, only dreamed of. Never had seen a national geographic Moscow and Rome and Paris and all these places. And everyone's speaking German around him. And he goes up to a ticket window and uh, doesn't know what to say. German is being blasted at him. And, and, and he hears, uh, it turns out to be a Hasidic Jew to the to the 
window next to him asking, saying that he hears the word Tel Aviv. And he goes, ah, OK, give me a ticket to Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And that's how he ends up in Israel. And he ends up uh, and he finds his way on to, to, to a kibbutz where he, where he works for a while uh, in an in an olive um, orchard uh, right across the uh, Jordan River. And he gets to go to uh, to Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, to see these things. And the uh, the history was just coming alive to him. He was touching like the hem of his Jewish heritage. They just really uh, dumped since when his great grandfather died when he was eight and they stopped really practicing. And then yeah. when his grandfather died and when he was 12, it was pretty much he had his bar mitzvah, but he's very much disassociated with all that stuff. Yeah. You know, it, 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 you can really feel it, too, in that chapter that he he's as, as you, you put it so eloquently touching the hem. Um, it, it's almost like it, that's as close to God as he's getting at that point. It really is. He you, even in the as you read the chapter, you 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 can. Uh, it feels so night and day. You, you 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 know he as he gets there, he's working on a farm. So he's as he's working on this farm, they talk about you can you can hear the the bullets whizzing by, um, in this eternal struggle, um, you know. Um, that the, the Israelites are having. Um, and so he's learning to dodge as he's in the olive groves, he's learning to dodge bullets, but at the same time, um, you're also, you know, he, he takes a couple of guys and he goes up to, uh, you know, goes up to a, you know, is it a mountaintop at that point? Um, yeah. And he's, he's watching the sun, sun, sunset. He's got blisters on his feet, lights up some hash He's watching the sunset and he's really feeling, for lack of a better term, he's feeling the presence of God and the presence of his ancestors and the presence of, of slaves that might have built the, the, the monuments around him. And he's really feeling history. And he's getting a sense of things that he would have never got staying in Brooklyn. And a sense of things that are not him. And, and not just his world, you know, when, when he's committing crimes, it's very much about how he's going to get to the next day in Tel Aviv. He gets a sense of the world as it is, was, and has been before him and where his place is in it. It's a much more worldly view. And I'm curious to ask you, David, why is it that Michael can't maintain that view of himself outside of himself? How is it that he, it, it took that trip to Tel Aviv to get him to think outside of himself? And how is it that he can't ever maintain that view? Yeah, you go, you talked about the immediacy of day to day. Yeah. When he gets back to Brooklyn, it just, you, I was hoping for him. And as he talked about what he got back into, how it just um, just to survive from day to day. How am I going to get money? Oh, go rob some more drug dealers uh, was the simplest thing to do. But to impress his mother, he even did hits, 14 hits for the mob. You know, he, he was he was hoping she would hear about it. She's living in California at the time, hoping she would say something. Mm. Or they were, when they would meet with him to give him the jobs, they'd say, oh, be sure you say hello to Shirley for us. Yeah. You know. And okay, why don't you say hello to Shirley for me right. and tell her what I'm doing? Yeah. So she'll be proud of me and she'll say something. Nah, no, those words were never exchanged. So a lot of what drove him, uh, it was, it, I had such hope for him coming back and experiencing what he did in, in Israel to, to, to touch the hem of his heritage and come back and change something. But as soon as he's in that place again, he just, that the ham just flies away and he's back into it. There's such a touching parallel here. And you just brought it up. You just brought it up. And that's this. I believe, was it at the Wailing Wall? He, he writes down on a, a, with, a, yeah. with a pencil and a piece of paper that he just wanted his grandma, who passes away 
um, the grammar you were talking about that that he that raised him that he he was uh, he has a, a touching moment with her the night before she passes away. He goes and sees her in a home. Um, they share Jello together. They watch TV. They reminisce. He has this wonderful moment with her, and she passes away. It's like she was waiting for him to show up. Like she was waiting for him to be there so she could visit with him one last time. She passes away. And then he wonders, it's it's like that was the spark to get him to go, you know what? I need to be a better person. I need to find me. You know, I need to make something to be for her to be proud of. And that was kind of what was the catalyst for all this to happen for him to go to Israel. Like maybe it was her divine intervention that got him to go to Israel. Yeah, it just tugged on him a little bit or right. pushed him. In his, yeah, right. And then as he's at the Wailing Wall, he writes down, I just want to find something to make her proud of me or something to that effect. You know, just find, you know, one thing to make her proud of me. And writes it down on a piece of paper, tucks it into the wall, right? But then the minute he gets back, it's what can I do to get Shirley to notice me? It's a complete switch. It's a 180. It's a, you know... What the woman who put all her energy into me, who tried to mold me, who tried to make me a good person, I just want to do one thing to impress her. But when I get back, pardon my language, let's try to impress the bitch who never gave a shit about me. Where does that come from, David? Yeah, you his know? mother, his mother. It's so that what, what parents do to their kids, <laughs> you know, and Edith. Grandma Edith uh, and her husband, Roy, that, that raised Michael, that was Shirley's parents, uh, they gave him so much support and so much love. Yeah. But even then, Shirley <clears throat> would interject. Uh, uh, Daddy Roy was dating a girl. He had a girlfriend on the side. Mm-hmm. When, she, when she found that out, she threw uh, Michael into a foster home. Hmm. To try and and told the father, told her dad, you, know, you behave, otherwise Michael Sting. Well, she was using just using her kid, and yeah. Michael kept running away, yeah, and coming home and yeah. coming home, and uh, just the the interaction between Shirley, Michael's mother, and and everyone in Michael's life, including himself, was just uh, poisonous. Yeah. I, I can I can see what you're saying there now, but it just I mean she was the closest thing he had really to a mother, and and yeah. I don't know and, I, it it confuses me it confuses me I mean well I, he lived he lived with his aunt Florence for a while too yeah uh, she, the the unmarried uh, uh, aunt and she he would come back and stay with her a lot and uh, she cared for him quite a bit. Uh, so she, that was almost a surrogate mother again, but never his mother. You know, and that's interesting too, that, that Morty is the one who, you know, in the middle of the book, Morty is the one who's bought the house and, and put Aunt Florence up, you know, and they, they share opposite sides of the same house. Morty is the one who really looks after Aunt Florence. And, and when Michael is looking for that place to rebound, when he comes back from Israel, uh, Morty is the one who puts his foot down and says, Michael, $10 a week. Um, and it's not going to be long-term, no. you know, because there's too much heat. Yeah. Uh, Morty's wife wasn't one that was too, uh, she saw how Michael took a lot of times they had lived before together in Florida and then back in Brooklyn before. So when he came back and Morty says, it's gotta be different this time. Yeah. So that forced really forced Michael to to go out on his own, but it was making the money. Not uh, he tried his tried his hand. He tried to go straight once. Worked as security guard at a clothing store until he saw all the employees were ripping off the store. So, and then one one evening when he was guarding the place, he was going through a stock room and he finds he finds. I forget how many thousands of dollars in a shoe box way up on some shelf. Mm -hmm. And he only takes half of the money, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Just fluffs up the rest of the money. Only takes half of the money. And he gives half of it to his buddy to set him up with a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he just dips into this world of crime again. 
and he was going straight as security guard. Now, now that that puts him off, puts him on that road again. Mm. So when when we're in Tel Aviv, it's it's interesting. He's he's working the straight and narrow. He's working on a farm. He's actually doing well for himself and and doing uh, some hard work. But he gets himself into a little bit of trouble. He can't he can't help but be mischievous. And he actually takes the the passport of someone who can't help but whine and complain all the time, one of his fellow farm workers. And he ends up hiding it because he he just thinks he, he wants to hear someone. He wants to hear this guy bitch and whine about something other than what he's bitching and whining about. And he tells the guy, I'll even help find it for you. You know, I, I didn't take it because he gets accused of taking it. He says, I didn't take it, but I'll help you even find it, you know. Uh, so he, he, he does eventually, but then he's found out. He's found out by the head of the, the farm. But he's also told, too, by the head of the farm, uh, we, we also know about other things. Has he, has he ever told about what those other things are? Do they find out about his background? Not that he knew of, but they, but they suspected other stuff. Uh, they must have checked some out. Now, this is early 70s, so you know that they aren't. Um, they don't have the internet to search for anything. They'd have to yeah. go telexes. They have to go communicate back to Brooklyn. Uh, he came in the country and the uh, immigration went through his paperwork and everything. So he, when it came in as Michael Hardy, so it wasn't as Richard Mandel. So he had his name. So maybe there's a connection made sooner or later, but they, they told him he had to go. They put him on a bus to Tel Aviv. We went and started sleeping on the beach. Yeah, and that that uh, doesn't uh, last too long. Although he does have an incident on the beach, which potentially could have been very deadly. Yeah, he, one of the few things that you could say was unselfish in his life. He ends up saving a Swiss girl that's drowning. And he, uh, some some guard notices comes by him some beach patrol person so oh my god there's someone in the ocean and he goes out there he's not a swimmer you know six one 280 pounds <laughs> pounding through the surf he manages to keep this girl alive swallowed a whole bunch of, of the mediterranean doing it yeah he ends up spending about a week in the hospital afterwards he just can't get rid of his cough and even on his way back to, to Brooklyn, he's having a tough time trying to, as he put it, cough the Mediterranean out of his system. Um, but he ends up getting an infection out of it that, that doesn't, he, you know, he, he ends up coming back in early fall. And it takes, what, a month or two in order yeah. to try and get it all out? And in that time, he ends up getting 103 degree fever. And, and uh, it's not an easy thing to get rid of. He almost dies. Yeah. Yeah, he probably had a form of pneumonia, something close to that. Crazy. So he, he manages to pull out of that, and then he's got to make money. Yeah. So he goes back to his to his ways. All this time, there's an interesting character in his background. He doesn't know how he feels about her, and that's a woman by the name of Hetty. Can you tell us a little bit about Hetty and how he falls into um, how she falls into Michael's life? Uh. It was fascinating. Um, she met her at a record store and uh, he started going out and hanging out with her. She, she was another a woman that looked a lot like his wife who looked like Natalie Wood. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, smitten by her. And Hetty uh, allowed Michael to, uh, to uh, court her in his way. And when he comes back, um, he knew her before he went to Israel. When he comes back, she's there waiting for him. And she finally takes Michael to meet her father. Her father uh, does not think much of Michael. Hmm. He pulls Michael aside and has a talk with him. And the talk is simple. If, if, um, if you or me, would you allow a got man like you to be with my daughter because Michael wanted to marry Hetty, but he was already married and the father had done some background checks on him. Mm -hmm. And that kind of told, put Michael in his place and told him uh, he, he couldn't 
couldn't do that. But he still, he still saw her a few more times. It was a real painful relationship for him. And he even, you even talk about in the book how when he's in places like Tel Aviv and he's, he's in different places, he, he is thinking about her. He misses her on a physical level. We'll put it that way nicely. Um, there's a different phrase that's used for it, but uh, he, he misses her physically, but it doesn't sound like he's really missing Hetty in a, in a love type way. It's, but, but, you know, he, he misses the companionship of Hetty. The, the sexual yeah. relationship for yeah. sure. Yeah. And the idea of being with a beautiful woman. Right. And, um, he's, he struggles with that. I, I don't know if he was ever really in love because he was never taught that as a kid but to be in love. is like, yeah. he was always, he had, you know, fell in love with Sheila. He thought uh, it was more like a possession. Uh, you, you know, Hetty was, could have been very much the same. It, you know, that didn't work out. It was a good thing the father stepped in. Let's talk about possession with with Michael for a moment, because, you know, it's it's funny when it comes to things like cars, when it comes to things like money, when it comes to things like places or apartments or homes, it's pretty much easy come, easy go with him. You know, oh, I can get more money. I can get another place. I can get another car. A car's engine freezes up. He goes and gets another one. Uh, he, you talk quite frequently through both books about how, oh yeah, this car went, I went and got this one. And you know, I, I don't have money. I go and I rob a drug dealer. I go and rob a bank. I go and get my guns. I go and get this. I go get more guns. If I don't have this gun, um, it seems like he runs through things quite quickly. You know, if I don't have this, I can go get this. It's only money. It's only guns. They're only houses. Why then when it comes to women? Two women in particular, Hetty and Sheila. Sheila, most importantly, there's a possession issue. Why is yeah. that? I'm, I can never figure that out about him. I, I do remember when he got out of, um, out of uh, the Bordentown Reformatory, where he did two and a half years for uh, being a part of a robbery of the Greenville Bar in, in New Jersey. Um, he got his GED when he was in there. They allowed conjugal visits. Mm-hmm. And she got pregnant, so he had his son born while she was there. Robert was born. And when he got out, he they went to live with his, his mother for a while and in the basement. Mm-hmm. And the first night he was there, he found out that, you know, he he just worked her till the point where she finally admitted that she had been, been with someone else. And it was just the the ultimate deception yeah how could you even though he had been but how could she you know the chaste mother of his child Mm -hmm. all that so his his relationship with her could never really be whole because he felt that that kind of betrayal is it is this may seem like a weird question to you david but is it the actual ownership of a woman or is it the fact that it can be taken away from him does he Mm. not like things being taken away from him personally that's a good question maybe because because in the end sheila was taken from him even though he gave her away freely he said i give you your freedom it's almost it's almost grandiose it's narcissistic i give you your freedom he she never had anything to give away he never had anything to give her you know he 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 really didn't she she's a human being she has her own human rights you know, I mean, if she wanted to, she could have walked out on him at any time, told him to go F himself and, you know, good luck getting your kids. Um, you know, she he didn't have any choice in the matter. But the fact that he, quote unquote, released her, uh, that was his choice. But yet he feels like she was taken away because she made an honest choice to move on. Yeah. But he looks at it as she was taken away. She was never taken away. She made a choice to move on with her life. But it's the thing that she was taken. Hetty was had had the choice. He had the choice of being of Hetty being taken away. She was taken away by her father. 
the choice of being able to do whatever he wanted with Hetty was, quote unquote, taken away from him because the father stepped in and said, you know what? If you were me, what would you do? You're right. You limited my choices. You've taken her away from me. Yeah. Is it really yeah. a, a narcissistic, grandiose thing to say that he doesn't like things taken away from him, like a child with a toy or candy? Probably. Yeah, probably. Because narcissists can't really love. They don't feel love. Yeah. It's a possession thing. I would, he was, he, we had a conversation. Actually, he had the conversation with his daughter one day about whether he is a psychopath or a sociopath. <laughs> he, you know, it was, he was talking to her. It was the, the advice he gave her. I was sitting there. He said, let's take, take a moment for this call. Mm -hmm. And, and he, um, as he explained to her, her 14 year old daughter was seeing a 27 year old Mexican. Mm -hmm. So he made sure. And, um, she wasn't listening to her mother and said, well, tell you what, do what I did to you and do what it did to me. Put her in foster care. Look how well we turned out. Oh. <laughs> and that, that is just a, that is, uh, it was so profound to hear those words come out of him and, and realize that he really thought he turned out fine. His ego probably wouldn't allow him to think anything else. No, no. I would I would argue a little of both because yeah, there's yeah. a there's a there's a, a line when he's in Israel and he's you know he says he used to practice he, he got that knife that he used to keep in his back belt and he said uh, what was the name of the fighters Fat, Fatah the, oh yeah the Fatah over yeah. in Jordan yeah over in Jordan. F A T A H yeah Fatah, yeah and he said I I can't wait to kill one of those guys if they come out of the bushes. That's a psychopathic thought. Who who sits there and goes, I can't wait to kill somebody. Right? Psychopathic thought. Yes, but at the same time, he was feeling so much an Israelite. And I'm protecting the country. That's a little bit of a feeling I got from him. That's a justification, though. Well, of course. <laughs> right. That's That's not, I mean, I don't sit around, you know, I don't sit around thinking, well, I, I can't wait to, I can't wait to kill an, an ISIS fighter. You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't do yeah. that in my daily life. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, hit me that, you know, I don't feel nationalistic pride or anything like that over, over nine 11 and say, you know, if an ISIS fighter shows up in Minnesota tomorrow, I'm going to slit his throat. It doesn't, I don't think that on a daily basis. That you want to slit his this road yeah that, yeah that, that's that I, difference I, yeah i, I, I you can't know. wait oh yeah yeah if he shows up and, and yells you know all hail isis i i'm gonna jump up from behind and slit his throat i i just yeah. and then and then salivate and rub my hands together i mean that's not you know that's not part of my makeup so i'm pretty pretty confident i don't have a psychopathic makeup um but in his in his eyes he was just ready yeah you know yeah um sociopathic absolutely i think he had a little bit of that in him too i i think you could answer the question with both i i don't think you have to choose one or the other i think you get a twix you get both chocolate <laughs> and, a, and a cookie bar in the in both in that deal you know uh tell me a little bit about how you know we had mentioned in the last program you had mentioned that he had uh run-ins with sammy the bull gravano how does sammy the bull gravano get introduced to uh, michael hardy uh, Louis Melito was someone that uh, Hardy had seen around uh, the record store. Mm -hmm. He had some kind of piece of it. And um, he mentioned to Sammy that he had a couple guys that had been doing good work in a, in a gang called the Rampers. And maybe Hardy would like to meet him. So he did. And uh, uh, Hardy you know, kind of did his own interviewing. You know, they discussed, you know, where to get the best food. They they uh, they met at a diner that Sammy and Allie Boy Cuomo uh, uh, picked up, probably to squeeze some some owner 
<laughs> hard enough. The guy borrowed money from him. Anyway, they ended up owning some diner, some little diner. And uh, he met him there. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll use these for some jobs to come up, some stuff that required some real heavy lifting. Because his crew didn't wasn't going to about whacking people. People weren't heavily armed when they go and do what, what he needed to do. And they found when the, uh, the first, the first one was, uh, some karate instructors that had a bunch of money and a bunch of drugs. And they, he sent Sam and alley boy in there. Uh, and he sent this little wannabe. They was training, a, a intern, I call him Kevin, a down out the back, uh, dumb out the, back balcony of where this apartment was and he waited there and um all the all they threw all the drugs out the window and mm. it fell fell down to kevin he collected them and they collected a bunch of money and they split that up and it turned out pretty good so they started pulling a lot of jobs together probably the most significant ones were their uh dirty cop by the name of angelo angelo benson vega um uh, would uh ran a a uh, i was just reading about him yesterday uh he was grand jury indicted him for uh uh for lying under oath and it had to do with giving guns to hardy really yeah and he but, uh, but uh he set him up to kidnap big drug lords in the city for million dollar ransoms and sammy was involved in those they did three of those they did uh they also uh cops dirty cops would go on these routes and they collect money mm -hmm. and they would hit the the dirty cop at this last stop when he had a whole grocery bag full of rolled up bills with a bunch of bagels on the top of it and they'd <laughs> throw them throw the cop in the trunk and they take off and they split that money so this dirty cop was sent and i asked him i said come on 19 it's the early 70s I mean, you, you were pulling in a quarter million dollars, but what'd you do with the money? Cause he had no homes. He had no, yeah. And he get angry. So well, what do you mean I did with the money? Well, what'd you do? I know you, know, you can be generous to family and stuff and buy a car, a TV and gifts or something Christmas time. But how do you go through that much money? Right. He didn't want to talk about it because <laughs> he never stashed it away. Never, never had any, any, uh, safety net whatsoever. You know, I'm with you. I, I, I don't, how do you spend it? I mean, cause that's a lot of money at that time. Tax free. <laughs> yes. Tax free. So to speak. Right. Cause yeah, he, it's not like he's showing up at the IRS offices and going here, here's your cut. Um, yeah. yeah. How do you, how do you spend that? Well, he used to, he liked to play the part. He did this in the early sixties when he started uh, when the he ran into the Gotti's in the first book um, and they're they were robbing uh, uh, some drug dealers they were, they knocked over a bowling alley uh, some stuff like that uh, where he'd walk in wearing a nice Italian suit and tip tip the mater D a hundred bucks a hundred bucks and in the early 70s still big money yeah he tip 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 money 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 so he was, you know, hundred dollars on a weekend. You could go through eight to ten grand, I suppose. Sure, but he wasn't a gambler, you know. Which is, which, uh, which I'm trying to figure out what happened to money, but it just flowed, flowed out, and he didn't too spend too much on his family either. See, I, I could see if he was taking that money and giving some back to mom, or giving some back to Morty, or giving some back to the aunt, or. Or no. even grandma, but uh, if you're not giving it back to family, where's it going? Well, the uh, one of the funniest things probably remember uh, remember reading about he had an airline ticket scam. A buddy yes. has worked yep. at a worked at a travel agency, and they get in the blank airline tickets. It's the early seventies mm -hmm. uh, didn't really have tr uh, credit cards yet, re really, yep. and uh, they would get a stamp. So they got a big block of hundreds of blank airline tickets vouchers mm -hmm. and they need to get the stamp from the travel agency. So he went and uh, broke into the travel agency. He had to show it was a break in. He stole the stamp out of the safe because he had the combination. But while he's there, some old lady knocks on the door and he gets, and she comes in and he has to dissuade her from going on any kind of trip. 
Mm-hmm. He's, he was really uh, Nick Pelleggi who wrote uh, uh, the book and the screenplay with Marty Scorsese for both Goodfellas and uh, Casino. Knew Michael Hardy for 35 years. He said he's one of the most intelligent criminals he ever met for forgetting whether he was good with women or something or good with money, but just most of them were just thugs. Mm-hmm. And he was so much more than that. He could charm. He could. Uh, so they ended up doing the ticket scam where they would buy round trip tickets to LA and then also buy round trip trip tickets to first class to Hawaii, which they would cash in for cash. This is back in the early 70s when it was not, let me recharge your credit card. Or no, it's all cash. And then he would try to ingratiate himself to his mother, early 70s. She was living down in the San Diego area. She'd drive up and he'd give her a taste. Here's here's 500 bucks for you, mom. Jeez. Just again, just trying to, one time she showed up with a baby. Huh. And he said, he said, well, what's, what's this kid all about? What's this baby doing here? She said, well, you know, my, my husband, uh, wanted to have a baby. Yeah. But you had a baby, you're pregnant. You know, she was 44, but she told her husband she was 34. Oh my God. <laughs> Rahulio was a, uh, was, a had been a federale that saved her from being raped in the Mexican in Mc jail. So she kind of glommed onto him. So he wanted a baby. So here's my baby. Well, how'd you get it? She tells him over dinner. Yeah, I, I took got him from a Mexican couple, mm. you know, and she was hoping to get welfare for the kid. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. She was she was always working some scam. And then she had to give up the kid because when she went to the where, welfare, the the uh, the uh, birth certificate wasn't up to snuff and. You know, they called her on. So she ended up selling the kid to someone else. Oh, just 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 uh, you got a glimpse of how um, just careless, heartless she was. Yeah. Oh, who did he learn it from? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny about the airline scam is is it appears I, I take it you're a fan of the Sopranos or you've watched oh, the Sopranos yeah. before. So something similar shows up on the Sopranos and it's funny how many gangsters have said, you know, to David Chase, how did you come up with that? You know, who do you know on the inside who told you that, that that's an actual scam? Oh yeah. They yeah. did that for a long time. Yeah. For about a, for about a year. They milked it as, as long as they could. Mm. It's funny how, uh, how some of that real life stuff makes it to TV. Um, let's talk a little bit too, before uh, we leave people today about Michael Hardy's connection with Rudy Giuliani and uh, the whole uh, stuff in Brooklyn with dirty cops. How, how does Michael Hardy come into Rudy Giuliani's scope of things? You know, Rudy Giuliani, his claim to fame was cleaning up New York and I think the last thing Michael Hardy would want to do as a career criminal was clean up New York, um, essentially since he was the one who was trying to dirty it up from the beginning. Well, uh, Giuliani really had a, uh, the one thing he could not abide by was dirty cops. Mm-hmm. So when Michael was uh, arrested for uh, the stolen car, he was he was running one of the fingers of the international five fingers international car theft ring. Mm-hmm. He would drive him out to California where his mother would sell them. Mm-hmm. And she let him pile up and some little old lady saw him and, you know, called the police. They sat on the street. They saw these new Cadillacs with with New York plates, you know, sitting on her street outside of La Costa and they busted her. And to reduce her time, she gave up her son. So they so they arrested Hardy back in New York. Uh, he pretended that he's a fearful of flying. So they trucked him. The U.S. Marshals drove him all across the country. He got into San Diego and he um, uh, he ended up cutting a deal uh, with the uh, with the prosecutor there uh, to. Well, he was going to call out 23 witnesses and they they weren't going to for this for this case they weren't going to uh spend all that money to drag witnesses out to california so they his lawyer put in a change of venue hardy came up with the idea take it back to new york 
But the prosecutor said at that the time, too, there's a there's a guy in New York trying to clear up everything. A uh, bunch of crime in New York. Maybe you can do something. So when he got back to New York, that's when he put out feelers and uh, got a couple um, detectives working for Giuliani's office, told them a few things about a, a dirty cop, this Angelo Bensabega he worked with. He'd been a detective, a Manhattan detective. And he worked out and he wore a wire for him. And wow. that was the that was the first time he wore a wire for him. He wore a wire for him too when he got out of Danbury prison in late seventy four. Uh he went to a halfway house in the in New York where they ended up uh the two mar- the two marshals that ran this uh were scamming the ex cons. And ch- trying to charge Hardy five days a night not to stay there. Really? So he wasn't going to get scammed. So st- to hell with you. And guess what they did? They shut off the heat to his hotel room. So he said, okay. He contacted the marshals he worked with before. He said, I got some dirty marshals. I got the federal, federal detectives that work for Giuliani. Got some marshals here. And they, they, um, uh, they wired him up and they brought him down as long as, as well as his parole officer. Huh? So he was, yeah, he got to know you. He even planted a uh, Giuliani, um, made him wait too long in the, uh, like half a day to come meet with him. So Hardy planted a couple marijuana seeds in a plant in his lobby. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have some leftover in a baggie somewhere. Nice. Nice. So do you think when you look at things here, David, do you think it was, you know, a lot of people when, when, and, and if you look back at far away history, a lot of people gave Giuliani a lot of credit for cleaning up New York uh, at that time and basically making Times Square Disneyland if you put it that way, do you think it had a lot to do with the brilliance of Giuliani or did it have a lot to do with the, um, just the breaking point in New York? Do you think it was that, that point where New Yorkers just wanted to see a better horizon at that point? And there was a lot of people willing to come forward. And, I think and cooperate? yeah, that, that, that feels like more would happen. I spent some time there in the eighties mm-hmm. and you could see the, the the change that had been changes that have been made um they they did things uh they uh espoused the broken window theory uh that they had picked up that had been doing it and it worked so well in mexico city where as soon as they found any graffiti or anything like that on a subway uh they would take that car out of service clean it up right away so after a while, it was uh, you showed you cared, mm-hmm. and then everyone cared. If you showed you didn't care, no one cared. They kept on breaking more windows than an abandoned building. You know that was the idea behind it. Uh, so you could see some of that coming about. Uh, he Giuliani did a good job. That's that's his big claim to fame more than anything else, probably. Yeah. Cleaning up New York, he he didn't make a lot of friends. No, he, he he made a lot of enemies during that time. Uh, well, even even Hardy, I mean, the way uh, Giuliani wiped the books clean from all his crimes except murder, unless that murder came up. Mm-hmm. And he had people going from courtroom to courtroom and just cleaning up everything that was outstanding. All those six agencies were after him after he got out of uh, La Mesa del Diablo cleaned up all that trash. Yep. So he had really a clean slate. And then Hart, Hardy thought that the deal was too good. So he took off. He left Giuliani holding the bag. So Giuliani just, when they finally arrested him in, in North Carolina, um, they ended up throwing, throing Hardy in, in, uh, in uh, West street jail for a while. And then finally dumping in Danbury. They were tired of him. Mm. Tell me a little bit about uh, about Michael Hardy after his dealings with Giuliani uh, towards the end of the book here and, and where we leave uh, Michael going into the third book. Uh, he had one one more opportunity. Well, the opportunity presented itself because uh, he, after he got a Danbury, he contacted uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano. 
and Sammy wouldn't give him the time of day. Hardy was looking up for a little leg up, a little help somewhere. You know, he wasn't committing crimes or anything. He was supposed to, he was on parole and Sammy just did one of those. Hey, let's go do coffee sometime. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hardy knows what that means. So he ended up going to the feds that he worked with before and said, uh, I knew who killed the Dunn brothers, uh, unsolved murder. Uh, the Dunn brothers owned some, um, a car wrecking place. Okay. And, um, and they took his statement. He signed it. He said, okay, you're going to, he said it was Sammy, the Bulgavani, Louis Melito and Ali boy Cuomo were the guys. He, uh, he told them that Sammy had told them that one time when he was bragging over dinner, he never did. He was just trying to get back at Sammy. So they put him in witness protection and they shipped him to LA Hardy. And he got to choose the name, the alias that he would use. And he showed Michael Harden, H A R D I N. No, because he was so he was so proud. He was, thought he was an outlaw, a gunslinger like John Wesley Harden from the late eighteen hundreds. Okay, he really liked that name. You know, he's an outlaw. Hmm. You know, and so he goes to hard and goes to Hollywood under that name, and they put him in some flea bag hotel mm-hmm. uh, the relax motor in and he's got to meet his handler every every monday morning where the guy's going to be 175 bucks a week and they pay for this cheesy hotel and hardy looks up a um while they're waiting for uh obviously to be called back to new york to testify and that goes on for almost two years meanwhile hardy uh, looks up an old contact of his uh, character actor by the name of Michael Pataki, not the governor, right. former governor of New York, but I, and he, um, this guy's been shooting some stuff over at this B level studio called Raleigh Studios. So Hardy, Hardy goes there over there, gets introduced to the president of the company. Guy hires him on the spot, not legally, <laughs> but prints up some business cards, calls him a producer, but Hardy's meant to be his muscle. Hmm. Get in the way. All these people were throwing money. Some guy owned a bunch of dry cleaners, threw, a, threw half a million dollars at him to go make a movie. So Hardy ends up stepping in to protect the 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 president of the studio. Mm-hmm. And, that, and he ends up, you know, going, hey, I'm making movies. Well, not really. <laughs> You're providing <laughs> muscle. But he's figuring out a way. And it's within. It's not breaking the law. Right. It's, skirting things uh until he meets deborah the woman that ends up becoming his wife uh and she's uh she's a hooker she meets Mm -hmm. down in san diego she has been while his hardy's mother shirley's in prison she's she stole a bunch of her lilac crystal to sell it and so he grabs his this girl deborah says will you come in with me you're working it off and she's just the right kind of accomplice for him to start setting up drug dealers to rob again. So he starts doing that while he's under WITSEC. Wow. That takes some guts. It, well, he knows, but he knew the business. He knew exactly. And he could be charming when he wanted to. Yeah. He was just so disarming. Big, big, uh, you know, 6'1", 250, 280. Mm-hmm. Just real congenial kind of guy. No problem. Yeah. I tell you what, folks, uh, you got to get book two or three. Uh, although we've talked extensively, we haven't talked that extensively about the book. There's so much more to the book. There's so many interesting uh, little stories in here about Michael and some of the things he pulls in here. And some of the stuff will shock you. Some of the things that, that he got away with, some of the stories and interludes he has with Sammy the Bull and, and uh, other characters in this book. Uh, there's some other characters in this book that he has uh, little crimes and things that he does with people. You may read this book and go, there's no way that one person could do this much stuff in one lifetime, be it even just a slice of a lifetime. Mind you, when we start this book, he's only 25 years old, right? Right around 25, yeah. David? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how old is he by the time we get to the end of book two? Uh, it is six years later. That's it's it. only a six year 
sex swath of his life. So he's 31 by the time we get to the end of book two. Yeah. So let me ask you this before we leave people today, when we get to the beginning of book three at the age of 31, we have some stuff to look forward to. I know you had mentioned when we were talking uh, last program that he still has an encounter with Jesus to come. I know that. Yeah. There's still that, that he actually, and is it more than one? He, uh, in book two, he's introduced. He's introduced when he's in Danbury prison by Judd Tanner. He's introduced to Christ. They were, he, Hardy took, uh, he was, he took a, he, he signed for classes. He signed up for a German class because the instructor was married to a man who wrote a book about, about awakening of the sexes or something. He wanted to know about that, but she was just some old dried up prune of a German teacher. And yeah, he quit that class and he signed up for a Bible class. Okay. And he meets this guy, uh, a big executive of the maritime union. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, there's some, there's a piece about this guy. He, guys in for i think for three years or something he had uh, something to do with a ship blowing up mm -hmm. somewhere okay. um but uh they meet in this bible study class and they start walking around afterwards and every day they end the day and that's a federal prison so there aren't big gangs in these prisons and everything mm -hmm. uh they start and become the best of friends and uh mm -hmm. that really that's that's hardy's first glimpse anything about christ he still okay. considers himself a jew i made the mistake of saying so what's it, how does it feel to be a christian oh my god <laughs> he's just i ain't a christian he's a jew okay okay um uh then in 1991 when he's finally sentenced for the murdering murdering of his wife uh and sent to to prison uh christ visits him as, in his cell just shocks him and he's so inspired, he writes 77 poems. So we have that Just, to look forward to yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's more. There's more, yeah. folks, <laughs> in book three, which which David is working on right now. Um, so there's so much more to go. There's so much more to go. But again, I want to encourage you, uh, book two of three is, is available right now, The Last Jewish Gangster. Uh, we've got a link in the description of this program. And, of course, we're going to have David back to talk about book three. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more spiritual, a little bit more uh, on the supernatural side of things as we're going to talk about Michael Hardy's run in with Jesus in prison. So that's going to sound, uh, that sounds even more intriguing uh, as much as the, the true crime stuff is intriguing, David. Uh, that's going to be even more intriguing. We're going to cr cross the supernatural with true crime there in, uh, in book three. David, I have so much fun talking to you, man. I'm telling you, this, the, these conversations are so, so good. That's fun. You make it easy. Ah, oh, you make it easy too, my friend. I'll tell you that much. Um, but I, 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 I'll tell you, we're gonna we're gonna cut it short here. We're gonna go to dumb crimes and stupid criminals here in a moment. I just want to thank you so much, David, for joining us yet again. I was so excited when uh, David got a hold of me by email and said book two is ready, and I, 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 I jumped for joy when I saw that. And I, and the second thought, I, I, I thought already because <laughs> I didn't know it was coming out so soon. I, normally, you think you know when you talk movies, you, you're thinking a year, two years. But I was so pleased. I got to tell you, David, I was so pleased that it was ready so soon because I thought I was going to have to wait a long time to get the second part of uh, Michael's story. And I'm so glad that I didn't have to wait that long. Ah, you know, the uh, interesting aside, the lawyer that represented uh, Hardy for murdering his wife uh, in 1991, 1990, uh, Jimmy Blatt, uh, his uh, passed on the book to a big time Hollywood producer. Really? So you might might see this thing on the screen, smaller, big screen sometime in your future. That would be amazing. I would love to see this as a movie. I got to think the movie is going to be about 16 hours long. If they if they take the three books and put it to a literal screenplay, it would have to be a miniseries. Yeah. If not yeah. a series. I got to think you got to develop this for television. I wrote the, I wrote, already wrote the pilot script that's been circulating. Really? Hey, pilot script. Yeah. That's it's amazing. Fun. That's amazing. The book is The Last Jewish Gangster, The Middle Years, book two of three. David Larson is the author. It is out on Wild Blue Press. You can go to wildbluepress.com or you can click on that link in the description of this program. David, thank you so much for being with us yet again.
Thank you, Tim. A lot of fun, as always. Ed, yes, it was. And thank you so much for being with us. Folks, it's time now for us to go to Beer City Bruiser, and it's time for Dumb Crimes and Stupid Crimes. It's, it's Crayon News Story Time. What happened with this dude, Christ Bear? I heard he uh, cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony. Suspect pulls gun from butt, shoots twice at Denver police. What is your emergency? I need help. And what's the problem? I'm too high. You're too high? Yeah. It's that time once again, the time you're all looking forward to here at the back half of True Crime Tuesday. It's Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. We've both had a busy weekend, so let's see who's blown up the most. It's time to ring in the BCB, the big cuddly bear himself. He's been worked to death, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Beer City Bruiser himself. How you doing, Bruiser? I'm doing fantastic. I'm not worried about me. I'm, I'm kind of used to this. You, uh... You don't do a lot of cons, uh, uh, you know, and so no, I how don't. are you no. doing? <laughs> um, I, you know what? I had a wonderful weekend up until Sunday. Yeah. Uh, it was it was getting out of the Sioux that was uh, rough on me. Yeah. Um, we can give people a short, uh, a short, short uh, recap of, of my Sunday getting out of the Sioux. <laughs> it started with uh, rising out of my bed and looking at my back, neck, and... Uh, and everything else, and you may think, oh, Timmy had a hard time sleeping in the bed. It wasn't, I, I had a hard time sleeping in the bed. It was that something was sleeping in the bed with me, and it wasn't <laughs> a gorgeous, gorgeous woman there, Bruiser. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous bed bug. Oh, bed bugs are the worst. Yeah. The worst. So I'm a little bit up on my head, my back, my neck, and curiously enough, on my left inner thigh. Oh, so I think the bed bugs going after. Yeah, huh? Trying to get a little fresh with me, I guess. <laughs> uh, so then there I was like that. To go to deep dark orifices. That's right. <laughs> uh, so then there was that. There, there was that, and then, um, and then uh, getting out of the Sioux, uh, getting onto the airplane. I, what I thought was nice, first of all, the the, the uh, folks at the uh, Sioux City, uh, Sioux City, the <laughs> Sioux City, Iowa airport, which I got nowhere near. <laughs> Uh, the Sault Ste. Marie Airport were very nice. They um, they helped me out with my my baggage, uh, and I didn't have to necessarily because they have one of those things where you have to put it through the scanner yourself. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Keep in mind, I'm on a knee caddy, so that that's kind of hard to do. Yeah. Uh, so they did it for me. The only problem is is um, we had a bit of a situation. It seemed like <laughs> all weekend long we had a situation with airplanes. Well, yeah, it's. That's the thing. I had a situation I told you about. So yeah, yeah. Uh, getting there, my airplane again, second time now going to Sault Ste. Marie in about the last five six years uh, had engine trouble. I think <laughs> I think Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan's trying to kill me. <laughs> I think is what it is. They want to make you a permanent resident. That's right. Uh, so interestingly enough, on the way there. Uh, there was a strange whirring, whistling sound coming out of the engine. You don't want to hear that on a plane. No, you never want to hear that. Uh, and we went, what the? And I looked at Chelsea Layden from Destination Fear, kind of apropos. And I said, do you hear that sound? And she was like, uh-huh. And so they said, well, we're going to sit on the tarmac here. We, we can't get... We can't get um, we can't get maintenance to come to the tarmac, so we're going to turn the, the, the plane back into the gate, okay, okay, and have them look at it there. So we turned the plane back into the gate, and they start to look at it, and they said, hey, folks, we can't get an accurate reading on the engine with you all sitting on the plane. I don't know if we're all fat asses or what the deal is. <laughs> but yeah, the, that, was, that, that threw me when you told me that, yeah. the, the story before. I'm like, wait, what? I, I think they're just making stuff up now. Um, but they said, so... In order to get an accurate reading on the engine, air quotes, uh, we need you all to deplane. Be sure to take your stuff with you. Well, about okay. one third of the plane actually listened to what the, the flight attendant had to say. And they took, you know, most of us took our stuff with us. Some of yeah. them left stuff on the plane. I, you know, they would have lost it if we decided to take another plane. Well, we all ended up getting back on the same plane. They said, everything's fine. Maintenance has checked it. We're all good to go. Yeah. Good news, right? 
Perfect. Well, get we get plan. Let's take off. Right. So we all get back on. I look at che- Chelsea. I give her the thumbs up. We're good to go, Chelsea. We're going to have a, a clean flight all the way to the Sioux, right? To which they fire up the plane again and you hear. <laughs> and I look at her like, oh, my God, I'm going to die next to Chelsea Layden from Destination Fear. Yeah, they put duct tape on whenever it was making the noise. It's okay. Right. Now, I've flown before to a destination with one engine. It happens. It happens. Um, so, you know, it can be done. Yeah. Yeah, it can be done. Um, so it, it, I didn't want to try and do it again, but <laughs> but we, we ended up getting to the Sioux on one and a half engines. And so you got it. You're safe. We're safe. We got in. Yeah. Uh, my partner in crime on the speaking circuit this year was Tim Weisberg, whose plane also got to the Sioux late. Uh, but mainly because of overbooked issues with the flight. Which blows my mind. Yeah. Don't they have a number of tickets they can sell? Yes. And when you get to that number, you just stop. <laughs> you know, you it's, would not like, think. it's not like a sporting event where a fire marshal comes and checks to make sure you're at code. It's just, hey, we have 140 seats on this plane, so we have 140 tickets. Why are they selling 145? But much like Bruiser, a sugar addict who's put himself on Weight Watchers and is sitting in front of a Halloween candy bin, um, you just can't stop at one. No, you can't. No, you got to eat the whole damn bin. (laughs) Um, So the airlines decide we have all these customers. Let's take them all. Um, Yeah. So they overbooked the, the, the and it's always by five, isn't it? It's always by five. Yeah, because that's the uh, overflow that they can take. Yeah. Three yeah. weeks, it was by five for yeah. my flight. Yeah. So, so they overbooked the flight by five, of course. And they said, well, we need five volunteers for Tim's flight. We need five volunteers. And they got the bidding from 600 to $1,200 in, vo- in vouch- vouchers. I almost said vultures, uh, <laughs> which I, I didn't mean to call the, the airplane company that, but they, they kind of were. Uh, yeah. $1,200 in vouchers. Uh, a room for the night, and, of course, some food. Uh, which, which, I don't know if you ever got a meal voucher from them. It's nothing to no, it's, t- call home about. No, it's not like it's chilies or anything like that. It's Right, exactly. You know, it's, it's pretty much just whatever gruel they can come up with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if they got five people, but they eventually took off about an hour and a half to two hours late, God. Which uh, by the time Tim got in, it was twelve thirty or one o'clock in the morning. So we didn't get together until that morning of the talk to get our stuff together. Luckily, we're two savvy radio guys who work on the fly, <laughs> and we got our presentation together. And it seems like people enjoyed it. So that's, that's good. good. That's good. Fast forward to Sunday in the Sioux, and it's time for your boy Timmy to take off. Bug bites and all. Cruiser's coming home. Cruiser's coming home. That's right. So I'm sitting there on the airplane talking to everybody and enjoying the ride. And I say, hey, everybody. It's time (laughs) now to take off. Go home. And uh, it just so happens that um, we uh, were sitting there waiting for the airplane. And they say the same thing. Hey, everybody. We're overbooked by five. Who Who wants to take some voucher money? Who wants to take a you, later you were flight? On the plane when they said this? No, no, no. We were we were sitting. You were in the, okay, you're still in the yeah, gate. Yeah, we're, gotcha. we're waiting. Yeah, we're waiting at yeah. the gate. And they're like, "Who wants to take some voucher money? Who wants to take a later flight?" Well, it just so happens that it's already evening. Yeah, nobody wants to stay later. Who wants to wait until 10, 11 o'clock at night in an airport? In an airport <laughs> that has nothing in it. This yeah. is basically like waiting in somebody's living room. Yeah, there's a if you're lucky, there's a Coke machine. It's yeah. not like you're in, you know, the Sault Ste. Marie Airport doesn't even I mean, they don't even have a sandwich machine. Oh, yeah. So it's it's not like you can go to the food court and wait. Right. Right. Whatever long you got to wait. Yeah. yeah. You can't sit at the local Burger King and have a have a little something to snack on. And I'm sure they don't have a bar. So you no, no God, way get no. alcohol. No, you'd have to leave the airport and find the local bar in the Sioux. Yeah. Um. So you're, you're stuck, you know? Um, so nobody was biting on that deal, right? <laughs> no, nobody's leaving that deal. Uh, so we get out on the, uh, we get out on the gate there and we're waiting and, and uh, then they push us back to the tarmac and we we think we're getting ready to fly. And I'm sitting next to Dakota Layden from Destination Fear. 
His sister, Chelsea, is just one seat, two seats over and up one row. So I'm like, oh, this should be good. We should have more engine trouble now because now Chelsea and I are in essentially the same seats we were on the flight there. Yeah. And uh, as we're sitting there, we're waiting. We're about 15 minutes late. Then we're about half hour late. And Dakota and I were talking hockey because we're both hockey fans. And I say to Dakota, after about half hour, I say, uh, does it seem like we've been sitting here for a while? And he goes, yep. I go, how long? <laughs> he goes, about half hour. And I go, huh. And all of a sudden we hear, rrr, 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 rrr. They're opening something. Yep. They were opening up the, the baggage hatch. Oh, they're overweight. They're overweight. So they're taking luggage off. They're taking luggage. And not telling anybody. <laughs> That's right. They're not telling people whose luggage they're taking. But I'll give you three guesses as to whose bags they got. <laughs> they got one of mine. Oh, no. So I land an MSP, and I go and I get one of my bags, but another one of my bags is missing. Yeah. So I go up to the baggage claim, and I say, hey, I got a tag here, but no bag. Where is it? And they say, oh, it's, uh, it says here uh, CIU. Uh, do you know where CIU is? I said, well, I CIU, there ain't no bag right here in my hand. <laughs> I can tell you where it's not. <laughs> yeah, it ain't here. Well, hold on a second. And he asked the lady who's evidently the supervisor, where's CIU? She goes, that's Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Oh, he goes, well, it's in the bin at CIU, Mich or in the CIU, Saint, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And I went, well, that doesn't help me because I'm in MSP, Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> I'm he goes, here. Yeah. He goes, well, we can mail it to you. Well, what's that going to do me? <laughs> and I learned a long time ago, Bruiser, never put your medications, especially all the medications I'm on, yeah. never put your medications in your check baggage. And I no never. longer do that. I put it in my carry-on. I learned that the first time I started flying for, for underwater needle point. Yeah. Two things you pack in your overnight bag, your carry on, your wrestling gear, your medication. And it seems like almost every person I knew at the convention or everyone I talked to had flight issues. Oh yeah. That's, that's the uh, trend nowadays is, is flight issues. Um, here in, here in North Carolina, American airlines announced, Hey, don't book us for fall or holiday seasons because we're cutting flights. It's amazing. Yeah. I also feel, too, when people, when I don't know if this happened with you, but when people get on airport grounds, mm -hmm. common sense goes out the window. Yeah, yeah. Like, you could have a genius walk, and as soon as they walk on the airport, they're complete idiots. Yeah. I have to put my bag where? Yeah. Like you said, you get off the plane, take your stuff with you. And two thirds of them left their stuff on. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. When we had to deplane, yeah, deplane. Uh, when we had to deplane, uh, two thirds of the people took their stuff. They said, "Take your stuff off you with the you know at with this yeah. airplane, um, because we're we're you know we're doing the maintenance. We don't know if we're going to get back get back on this plane or not." With the idea that if the engine is shot, it's not like we're throwing a new engine in it and we're going. <laughs> No, you're getting a new plane. You're getting a new plane. Um, a third of the people left their stuff on the plane. Like yeah, they're going to let you back third. on to get it. Yeah, and and I guarantee you, if you guys would have switched planes, that, that one third would be arguing. Like, well, no one ever said anything. Like, I didn't know that my bags would be stuck on a plane. What did you expect? Right. Common sense. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. So it's, it's just funny stuff. Yeah. Speaking of common sense. <laughs> it brings us to our dumb crime, stupid criminals. That's right. We got a whole bunch of stuff having to do with dumb crime, stupid criminals. By the way, I want to thank the people who came out to uh, Michigan Paracon this weekend. I also want to thank the people who came out to see uh, Bruiser this weekend, uh, both in the Kansas City area and in North Carolina. Uh, lots of great comments, lots of people enjoying the show. And I want to tip my cap to all three audiences uh, who came out and had great things to say about the show. Yes, I, I love when the fans come up and, and share our little inside jokes that we have here on the podcast. It's And I know they're listeners, and it's great to talk to them. Yeah, yeah, lots of great great people this weekend, met lots of great people, and uh, lots of great uh, stories, lots of great uh, 
lot, lots of great things to share. And it was just great to get out and, and see people and talk to them and, and uh, spread the knowledge, spread the wealth, and, uh, and let you guys know that there's lots of good stuff coming up for, for both programs, uh, True Crime Tuesday and uh, Darkness Radio. So. Uh, let's get it started, shall we, Bruiser? Um, we're going to start serious, and then we're going to go to the funny. You know how we do uh, here on this program. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you heard the story or not. <laughs> Yes, yep. Ziggy did. <laughs> Ziggy heard this story. I she knew it. She heard it. She heard. Yes, exactly, yep. Ziggy. Uh, pregnant inmate's baby died after deputy stopped at a Starbucks. Wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you what? hear about this story? No, this is news no? to me. Okay. Uh, this actually happened. Was this Orange County, California? Yes, it was Orange Ca County, California. After more than six years, Orange County has settled with a former inmate for four hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars. The Orange County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously last week to award four hundred eighty thousand dollars to a former jail inmate who claimed she lost her baby after staff failed to get her to the hospital on time. According to USA Today, the episode occurred in March of 2016 when Sandra Quinones was six months pregnant. She pressed the distress call button in her cell after her water broke, but staff did not respond for two hours, according to a lawsuit filed on her behalf. Two hours? Two hours. Jeez. Yeah. Deputies chose not to call an ambulance and instead loaded Quinones into a prison van where she was forced to wait, bleeding and in labor. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, when deputies stopped at Starbucks on the way to the hospital, <laughs> believe the it or not. Yet? Nope. Well, let's stop by and get a latte. I need a latte before we deliver this baby. It's And, and I need that latte stat. <laughs> uh, that's where her baby later died. Oh, no. Yeah, it was at the hospital. Uh, county officials confirmed the settlement but declined further comment to news outlets, as did the police. Richard Herman, an attorney for Quinones, uh, told the L.A. Times the Orange County Jail is capable of sinking to the lowest depths. Unfortun yeah. Unfortunately, this is not the only occasion. Oh, come on. What, they want to stop and get Dunkin' Donuts, too? Well, you got to have something to go with the coffee. <laughs> uh the New York Times reported that Quinones, Quinones rather, first filed suit in 2020, but it was tossed out of federal court after well, county lawyers argued that she had exceeded a two-year statute of limitations for such complaints. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, that decision was later reversed on appeal based on a section of California law that essentially says the clock on the statute of limitations doesn't start for incarcerated people until they're released from custody. I was going to say, what are you supposed to do if you're in, in jail? It's not like you can just walk up, pick up a phone, and call your lawyer. Well, evidently, they think they have all the time in the world to file. I guess. Yeah. Uh, Quinones was originally arrested for possession of controlled substances. She spent significant time in jail after the miscarriage, resulting in PTSD and severe depression, according to Herman, who, was, who also described her as homeless and dysfunctional since her release. Nicholas Cohen, Cohan, rather, uh, another lawyer for Quino, Quinones, I'm having a hard time with her last name today, uh, said his client will never forget how she was treated that day and no amount of money will ever make her whole. But he hopes another pregnant or other pregnant women in Orange County lockup will receive better treatment as a result of the case. Yeah, it's not like she was having Braxton Hicks. Her water broke. She was bleeding. She was in labor. Call an ambulance. Let the you know the, the professionals do their job. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't know if you saw this story either. I know we were both busy over the weekend, uh, Bruiser, but um, Brian Robinson Jr., who is expected to start as a rookie in the NFL with the Washington Commanders, was shot over the weekend. I heard this. I heard this story. Yes. Uh, kind of a sad story. Uh, Washington Commanders rookie running back Brian Robinson Jr. was shot during an attempted robbery or carjacking. This, according to the NFL team, the 23-year-old former Alabama player was taken to a hospital with what the team called non-life-threatening injuries. The team said in a statement, staff members were with Robinson at the hospital. Coach Ron Rivera said he had been with Robinson. He is in good spirits and wanted me to thank everyone for their kind words, prayers, and support, Rivera said on Twitter. 
He wants his teammates to know he appreciates them all for reaching out and he loves them all and will be back soon with uh, doing what he does best. D.C. police reported a shooting in the northeast section of the city and said it was on the lookout for two possible suspects. Robinson, a third-round draft pick, was expected to start start for the Commanders this season. Uh, he had been particularly impressive during training camp in preseason games, likely earning the job over incumbent Antonio Gibson. Brian's been great, offensive coordinator Scott Turner said recently. He's r- a real serious guy. Football is extremely important to him. He takes a lot of pride in being a physical runner. Kind of interesting. Yeah, can you imagine you get your dream job and – it's almost taken away from you. Not and only, it's not your fault. Not only that, but you busted your ass to to yeah to get a starting position. Yeah, he worked hard, got drafted. You know, third round's not something to shake a stick at. You know, and then and then you were competing during training camp. You win the job. You think, oh, I'll just go out and some idiot tries to carjack you and shoots you. Yeah, like it's a, terrible. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. Hopefully he has a good recovery and has a, has a good season. Not a better season than our teams, but a good season. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't, ex- we don't yeah. want him doing better than our teams. No, but then again, but how, we good are, do well. how good are our teams really going to be? <laughs> uh, let's face it, Bruiser. I mean, yeah. we can have a, a come-to-Jesus moment at any time here. I mean, <laughs> we can be delusional or we can be real. You know, there's, there's that. Yeah. Speaking of delusion or real... Um, we could talk about the city of Cleveland here for a minute. Um, it turns out uh, we're having a uh, how did how did I turn this in my head before we crack mics today? This was going to be uh, this part of the show was going to be the um, stupidly famous or famously stupid part of our our uh, our program. Okay. Okay. Uh, it turns out if you're uh, if you're in the NFL and you're criminally famous, you can go to Cleveland. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It used to be Dallas. Now it's Cleveland. Yeah, now it's Cleveland. If you're going to get in trouble with the law, just escape to Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, because I remember it was the 90s. It was Dallas they went to. Yeah. Remember everybody in Dallas had a felony. That's right. But Especially if you loved cocaine in the 90s, you just went to, <laughs> you just went to Dallas. It was everywhere. Um, a rookie NFL punter is cut after a rape allegation. Oh, yeah, I've heard this. Buffalo Bills released Matt Ariza, who, by the way, hit an 82-year-old, 82-year-old, 80, <laughs> yes, he hit an 82-year-old, then kicked an 82-yard punt. In, so they did release him. Yes, he was released, but are you ready for this? Yeah. So he kicked an 82-yard punt in preseason. He was yeah. accused of assaulting a teen girl last year. A rookie NFL punter is out of a job after being accused of rape by a teenager, the Buffalo Bills released 22-year-old Matt Ariza on Sunday, or Saturday, rather, uh, two days after a civil suit accused him and two other members of last year's San Diego State football team of raping a 17-year-old girl at an off-campus party. That, according to ESPN, the local district attorney is weighing criminal charges. Bills coach Sean McDermott said Ariza seemed to understand, and I think we spoke again this morning, and he agreed that was probably the best thing. Now, yeah. the original story says that another, it, this is the original story, another NFL player is embroiled in disturbing allegations of sexual assault. A lawsuit filed in San Diego on Thursday accused rookie Buffalo Bills punter Matt Ariza of participating in the gang rape of a 17-year-old girl last year. At the time, Ariza was a star punter with the nickname of the Punt God. Be careful how you say that <laughs> at San Diego State. The teen in the lawsuit alleges that Ariza and two San Diego State teammates took turns raping her while she was intoxicated for about 90 minutes at an off-campus party in October. The other two accused players are Xavier Leonard and Nolan Pa'a Ewell. Oaliko, I believe his last name is. Uh, none of the men have been arrested or criminally charged, though that could change. Detectives have submitted the results of their investigation to the San Diego County District Attorney's Office, which will make the call per the Times. Ariza will, was drafted by the Bills after the alleged assault and won the position as starting punter this month. Uh, the Athletic reports that the Bills were not aware of the allegation when they drafted Ariza, but were aware of it when they cut the punter, 
or cut another punter rather and named a rise of the starter. The team declined to comment, citing the ongoing legal issues. Now, an attorney for the 22-year-old Ariza denied the allegation. He says it's a shakedown because he's now with the Buffalo Bills. This according to Kerry Armstrong, adding that there is no doubt in my mind he is innocent. The alleged victim says that she was, quote-unquote, inebriated when she arrived at the party and that Ariza, uh, aware she was in high school, gave her a drink that she believes was drugged. In the suit, the teen recalls drifting in and out of consciousness during the alleged assault and she went to the police the following day. Detectives had her make a phone call to Ariza, during which she had, or which he acknowledged having sex with her, and advised her to get tested for STDs. This, according to the lawsuit. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, right. Whole the punter's got some STDs, huh? Right, right. So uh, that that's a little forward. Um, now, on top of that, so to speak. It's been uh, reported that Ariza has signed a brand new contract with the Cleveland Browns. Oh, he's landing on his feet, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Um, Could have played for a Super Bowl contending team and landed with the Browns. <laughs> right. He just, uh, and, and this was reported as of last night. Oh, okay. That the Cleveland Browns kind of snapped him up. Let me uh, see if I can pull that story up here. I was watching television last night and they said, surprise, surprise, Matt Ariza um, had come up with, uh, again, let me see, I'm pulling this up here. Well, you're pulling that up. I can tell you a story about how I found out about this story. So Mrs. Bruiser and I were watching uh, preseason football. It just to be so happened to be the Carolina Panthers against the Bills. Mm -hmm. And the punter that came in was their third string quarterback. And punts a horrible punt. I mean, it was, I, sh I shouldn't say a horrible punt. It was a good punt for a third string quarterback. Okay. <laughs> and I says, why is there, you know, I'm, just asking, I'm like, why is a third string quarterback? So Mrs. Bruiser looked it up and goes, oh, well, here's the story. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not good news. <laughs> and it reminds me to a time when they did a, you know, when they do the combine and stuff, they brought in Warren Sapp and Donald Driver. And uh, your your boy uh, uh, Chris Carter. Yep. And they said uh, Warren Sapp had made the comment. Here's what you need when you get signed: you get a driver, you get a money guy, and you get a fall guy. And everyone said, "What's a fall guy?" He says, "A fall guy is for when you break the law. He's the one that goes to jail because yes. you don't lose your contract." <laughs> yep. Yeah, isn't that something? I remember yeah. that quote. Yeah, yeah. Which is an amazing quote. Um, yeah, I, I, when it was, I remember when that was said, and when when it was reported that he said that, I I I didn't know what to think. I didn't know either because Chris Carter, who's the nicest man in the world, from what I hear, agreed with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't that something? It's like, wait, you're the nicest football player in the world. Oh, now I get why you're the nicest football player in the world. You have a fall guy, so anytime there was something legal. He took the fall. But see, behind the scenes, uh, I've heard some stories about Chris Carter. I'll just put it that way. He's okay. not he's not as nice as you think. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, I've and actually I know some people have had some personal experiences with him. Well, I can't I can't listen to him because my mother to and, and my when growing up in our house, Chris Carter was was the man. He was you don't speak badly. In fact, my daughter, my oldest daughter's very first football jersey was a Chris Carter football jersey that my mother had found somewhere and bought it. Because Chris Carter, you don't speak bad about Chris Carter in the, the Bruiser household. Hmm. Yeah. See, so, I know I saw this story about Ariza signing with the, the Browns, and now I'm not finding it. <laughs> Maybe the Browns came to their senses and went, wait a minute, we got a bad rep as is. <laughs> we, got, we got rid of Baker Mayfield for Deshaun Watson, <laughs> who can't play the first 11 games because he's suspended. <laughs> Yeah, I, I maybe they did. Maybe I so, so maybe we should probably not sign this punter because we need a punter during the season. <laughs> I I know. Let me let me check one more source here. I, I I've checked a couple of different sources and um, 
they they're they're coming up empty. But I know I saw the story because I, I sat and I watched it. Maybe it's a now maybe it's a Mandela effect thing. Oh, it could um, be. Uh, let's see here. Um, it makes sense. It makes sense. So the Browns would pick him up. Like I said, I was I was shocked when the Browns took Deshaun Watson over Baker Mayfield. I know they were having problems with Baker, but Baker still got some some gas in the tank, you know. And Deshaun came with all that baggage, so it wouldn't surprise me that they're going after a punter who who isn't even he's it's a civil suit. He hasn't even gone to trial yet. Well, but I think it's it's because of the stigma and the fact that the NFL will suspend over just the stigma that's there. Yeah. They, they would, I mean, it, there, there's very little tolerance. Yeah. So yeah, they, they will. Yeah. It's not the nineties. Yeah. It's just the fact that it's, it's hanging, it's hanging over them. Uh, there's, uh, there's stories out there about, uh, the bill showing no urgency in dealing with the rape allegations. Um, really? Yep. Uh, lawyer for ex Buffalo Bills kicker Matt Ariser responding to the allegations. Um, but I know I saw the story that the Browns were ready to sign him. I like I said, it wouldn't shock me, but you know, kicker's going to land on his feet somewhere, right? Well, especially a guy who oh, see. There's something in the search right there. Cleveland Browns. Browns. No. no. Um, 82 yard punts, nothing to sneeze at. That's a I good mean, punt. A guy who can kick an 82 yard punt is not going to be out there for very. I mean, he's not going to be out on the free agent market very long. No, but it's just a matter of how long does the NFL want to suspend it for? Exactly. Now, that in itself, let's face it, that in itself is a sad statement. Yeah, it's a very sad statement. But in today's world of athletics, it's just the norm. Well, and I think it comes down to too. They're they're like, well, let's look at the crime, and it's not as serious as like an Aaron Hernandez who murdered somebody. You know, it's not that serious, but it's not as easy as a steroid scandal, right? Right. Or a drug scandal. Yes. Like the '90s Dallas Cowboys or Lawrence Taylor. Right. Right. But I'm, I'm trying to think back, and there was the Baltimore Ravens, right? Right. Ray Taylor, is that who it was? Uh, who, uh, but, uh, uh, the Ravens defensive end. Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis. But, got away with murdering two people. Well, now he claims he didn't and that there was uh, there was evidence suggesting it. Ray Lewis, okay. you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah. And he won a Super Bowl, didn't he? Did yeah. the Ravens win a Super Bowl? Yeah. yeah. I don't get the NFL. Yeah. I don't get them. Um, speaking of... Uh, Celebrities accused of sexual misconduct or rape. Uh, Arcade Fire singer Wynn Butler is accused of sexual misconduct as well. Really? Yes, Arcade Fire. I'm not familiar with Arcade Fire, but I the believe, kids might be listening to it nowadays. Is, is this the guy who was, um, did we report on him last week? Who was uh, married to, um, what's her face? The sing- no, you're thinking of the 21 Pilots guy. See, I get those bands mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the only reason I know Twenty One Pilots is because of my youngest daughter. She okay. loves the Twenty One Pilots, okay. and and uh, I just driving her to practice and school and all that. I I got to listening, and I and I they you know they got some bangers out there. Arcade Fire, I have no idea who they are. Arcade Fire got a huge push on uh, SNL this past year. They were on okay. a, they were on a couple different times. I haven't watched SNL in ten years. Okay. Uh, Arcade Fire frontman Wynn Butler has been accused of sexual misconduct by four people. Jeez. Yeah. Hey. But the singer claims the relationships were consensual. One I can buy. Two, yeah. Two, I might be a little skeptical. Three, I think you're reaching. Yeah. Four, I four, think. you're guilty. Yeah. Four, I think you got an issue with. Yeah. Um, one of the accusers is a gender fluid individual who uses... They, them pronouns claim Butler, now 42, sexually assaulted them twice in 2015 when they were 21 years old. Uh, Three of the accusers are women who say relationships were inappropriate due to age gap and power dynamics between them and the singer. The women said the interactions took place between 2016 and 2020 when they were between the ages of 18 and 23, Pitchfork reported. 
Butler was 36 to 39 during the alleged interactions. Butler, who formed the Grammy Award-winning indie rock group in 2001 with his now wife, uh, Regine, is it Shasang? Shasang? I'm curious how he did this, if they were on tour, because she's part of the band, I'm yeah. assuming. Well, it could have been side relationships. Yeah. 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 Which uh, I, I I don't get how people can do that. I, I'm on the road all the time, and I don't have the energy to have a side relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love my wife, too. Don't get me wrong. I, I love Mrs. Bruiser, but the energy that goes into a relationship, if you're on the road constantly. I remember when I was on the road seven days a week. You just don't have energy. Yeah, <laughs> you know? a, I barely had energy to get to the airport to get to the next show. It's a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. How am I staying awake for a side piece? <laughs> <laughs> so Regine Chassange, I believe, uh, denied any wrongdoing through a spokesperson uh, who said the interactions were consensual and he did not initiate any of them. So he's he's the one who yeah. is being picked on, I guess. It, you know, it doesn't matter if you initiate them or not. There's still sexual assault. Yeah. Uh, the accusers each outlined their interactions to Pitchfork, describing alleged unwanted touching, kisses, and photos of genitalia. Uh, the singer said in a statement that he was going through a period of depression and heavy drinking at the time. Uh, there's no easy way to say this. He is quoted as saying, and the hardest thing I've ever done is... Having to share this with my son, the majority of these relationships were short-lived, and my wife is aware our marriage has in the past been more unconventional than some, he said in a, in a statement. So they're polygamists. Sounds like that's what he's trying to say. Yeah, yeah. He, he's saying, yeah, we, we have an open relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, again, how do you find the energy for that? And, he, and he's a kid, too. Yeah. So you got to be a dad on top of that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Son, I don't know how to say this, but your your mom sits at home and I go, you know, try to do it with other people. Sorry, son, that really wasn't your aunt. Yeah. <laughs> we called her auntie, but it's not really auntie. Yeah. It's more like Shaggy. Um, <laughs> I have connected with people in person at shows and through social media, he went on to say, and I have shared messages of which I am not proud most importantly, he went on to say every single one of those interactions has been mutual and always between consenting adults. It is deeply revisionist and frankly just wrong for anyone to suggest otherwise. He says, he goes on to say, I have never touched a woman against her will and any implication that I have is simply false. I vehemently deny any suggestion that I force myself on a woman and or demanded sexual favors that simply and unequivocal unequivocally never happened he says um this statement continues while these relationships were all consensual i am very sorry to anyone who i have hurt with my behavior life is filled with tremendous pain and error and i never want to be part of causing someone else's pain well you were you jerk yeah yeah Bert kreischer burke kreischer said on a podcast one time and this is great advice for anybody that's in the entertainment business single, married, open marriage, whatever, never sleep with fans. Yeah. Because that's just giving them an opportunity, whether you're, you're guilty or not, that gives them an opportunity to come after you. It's true enough. It's true words. You know, yeah. And I'm not defending the Arcade Fire guy. I'm not saying that the victims were wrong. I'm just saying I see what Burt Crasher is talking about. True. Very true. Um. Stupidly famous or famously stupid, if you're ready for another one. Oh, yeah. I love when famous people do stupid stuff. <laughs> I'll let you decide. Um, I've stayed away from this topic long enough. Okay. Well, you know something, Bruiser? We got to eventually get to it. Yes, we do. We got to get to the man, the man who's been in court, the man who talks like this, the man who thinks that every conspiracy is a conspiracy on itself, yeah. the man who's been in court trying to defend himself. This is the, if, if we're going with the right way, it's the man whose lawyers are idiots and sent text messages to people. Right? That's right. They, yeah. they sent text messages to the, the, his, the prosecuting attorney, correct? That you <laughs> bet your ass, bruiser. <laughs> people say I look like him and it, it offends me sometimes. You do not look like him. And someone messaged or someone on uh, one of the Instagram posts, I mentioned him. And so I asked Mrs. Bruiser and she goes, oh, it's that that nutcase with the conspiracy theories. 
And I looked it up. I'm like, I do not. I think I look. I look like Larry the Cable Guy. If anything, I would say more Larry the Cable Guy. But uh, the, the only and then thing you hear how this guy just is an idiot. He's the, just an idiot. The only thing you two have in common is you have a beard. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cruiser. Yes, yeah. you got it, Timmy. I am not. Yeah. I do not look like him. Plus, let's face it, your uh, your voices are nowhere close. <laughs> Uh, lawyers are now accusing, and they're Alex Jones's lawyers. Yep. are now accusing Alex Jones of hiding assets. <laughs> That's right. He claimed bankruptcy. Yeah. If, if you, if you, if for for listeners out there, if you want to be truly entertained by uh, uh, just courtroom antics, watch the judge in this case. I don't know if you've seen this, but the judge at one point in time scolds him like a little child. Oh yeah. It's funny. It is hilarious. Yeah. It's like a 15 minute clip and it's hilarious because he tried to, he's trying to argue. And that's one thing you don't do in a, with a judge in a judge's courtroom. You don't argue with the judge. <laughs> Let the lawyers handle it. I love how just in a couple of different trials he's had. Yeah. And this, this is what kills me all the time. He'll get up there and he'll say, well, your honor, you know, it's a, it's all a show. I don't believe anything I say. And then he'll come back the next day and he'll say, well, you know, the Zionist crap, blah, 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 blah. I don't believe a thing. You know, I don't, I don't believe any of these people. Yep. You know, and he'll, he'll go on and talk. He'll, he'll give you the spiel from the show and say, I 100% believe in it. Then the next day he'll say, well, I was just feeding everybody a line. Yep. I don't believe any of it. It's all entertainment. My favorite part okay, of this court case was my favorite part of this court case is the the Sandy Hook parents. They 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 won the case, so they're trying to decide on the amount. And they said something like four million dollars, and the judge goes, "Nope, no, no, no. You can go a max of forty million dollars, and we're going with the max of forty million dollars." And I was yeah, like, was it what? forty or forty five? I thought was it forty five. Yeah. yeah, whatever it was, but they they lowballed it. Yeah. They're they're asking for the low ball, but he had pissed this judge off so much. The judge goes, "Are you sure? Yeah, because I'm willing to award this. Yeah, I'll, I'll go 45. <laughs> sure, why not? Yeah, you know, let's do it." <laughs> His lawyers are quoted as saying, "Alex Jones is not financially bankrupt; he's morally bankrupt." <laughs> so I think you know why now they sent the text messages over to the prosecution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lawyers for the families of Sandy Hook victims say Alex Jones has been shuffling millions of dollars between relatives and companies while claiming to be bankrupt. The families have said a or have asked a federal bankruptcy court to appoint a trustee to take charge of free speech systems, the parent company of the conspiracy theorist media empire. Uh, Alex Jones is here's the quote. Alex Jones is not financially bankrupt. He's morally bankrupt, which is becoming more and more clear as we discover his plots to hide money and evade responsibility. That is according to lawyer Kyle Farrar. He goes on to say he used lies to amass a fortune and now he is using lies and fictions to shield his money. According to a Thursday court filing, Jones systematically transferred $62 million into companies controlled by him and his parents after the families filed suit in 2018 over his claims the 2012 school shooting was a hoax. Jones put free speech systems in Chapter 11 bankruptcy soon before the first of three trials to determine damages awarded the parents of one victim $50 million. Uh, lawyers argued in Thursday's filing that the company had created a fictional $54 million debt to Jones's controlled company PQPR Holdings, which performs no services, has no employees, and has no warehouse to avoid so paying the families. So it's just a name. Yeah, it's, it's just it's a, a name and a piece of paper. Yep. Uh, the families are also seeking a court-appointed committee to restrict Jones's ability to control the finances of his Infowars out outlet. Uh, the Times reports, according to Thursday's filing, Jones started transferring up to 80% of Infowars' sales revenue to PQPR soon before he lost defamation suits filed by the families in a default judgment last year. In a separate case, Jones' lawyer Norman Pattis invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in a Connecticut hearing Thursday over the alleged improper disclosure of confidential medical records of relatives of Sandy Hook victims. This according to the AP. It's unusual for a lawyer to invoke the fifth during a disciplinary hearing, Judge <laughs> Barbara, uh, Barbara Bellis noted. That's incredible. 
This is all going to be a TV movie someday. You know that, right? Oh, sooner than later. Yeah, and they won't have to write anything. It's all out there. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Stupidly famous or famously stupid, we move on to a Miami nightclub where Takashi 6 ix girlfriend was arrested for punching him inside the okay. Miami nightclub. He's lucky it's just her, not the people he ratted on. That's right. Well, the people he ratted on at one time wanted him dead, and for some reason they decided to not kill him. Yeah. I, it, he did get federal protection at one time. But then he, he, did. Okay. he was so famously stupid, he decided to escape federal protection. Because <laughs> nobody's going to recognize him with his hair and the face tattoos. He's so stupid. Uh, the girlfriend yeah. of Brooklyn rapper Takashi69 uh, was arrested for allegedly socking him in the face at a Miami nightclub early Monday morning. The rainbow-haired rhymer told police that 25-year-old Rachel Watley slugged him and yanked on his chain during an altercation inside Kiki on the River. <laughs> I think Kiki she should have. River. Yeah, I think she should have just knocked him the f out. Yeah. Uh, investigating cops noticed marks on the rapper's face and booked Watley on a misdemeanor battery rap. Uh, those are just his shitty tattoos. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> He's not the worst tattoos. That's right. Uh, Watley, known as Jade. Uh, on her social media profiles has been uh, with the rapper for three years and has 1.7 million followers on Instagram. Oh, look at her. Yeah, she's famous. Yeah. Uh, she previously hit the headlines in 2018 after brawling with Cardi B inside a Queens nightclub over oh. allegations that she betted the Bodak Yellow MC's husband, uh, rapper Offset. Oh, <laughs> so she's been with Offset and Takashi. Six, six, she's, six. she's got great taste. Yeah. A uh, video obtained by TMZ shows Takashi, whose real name is Daniel Hernandez, uh, jawing with a group of agitated women, including Watley, outside the club after the fracas. The fracas. Fracas. Uh, one woman appears to throw a punch at Hernandez, who takes cover inside an exotic car parked nearby. <laughs> There's a real man for you. Instead of taking it, he tries to duck and hide. Well, he's yeah. not a real man. We know that. Yeah, just take your punch and go home. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Who bed hasn't been punched? I mean, I've been punched in the face so many times. Just take your licks and go home. That's right. The bed product told TMZ that he's attempting to bail out his battling beau, who is being held in a Miami lockup on a $1,500 bond. Oh, come on. He's got money. She, I was say, she can't afford $1,500. Come on. Well, it's it's With not one. It, what do you say? One point five million followers or something. So that she's, you know, 7. she's making money off that. Yeah, she can get herself out. But I mean, even still, he could just roll down there and bail her out. <laughs> yeah. No, he he doesn't want to. That's the thing. I bet. Yeah. He's like, no, I'm gonna let her sit. Uh, he noted that he declined to formally cooperate with cops, so he's not saying anything. Um, he he goes on to say. Uh, you have to evaluate her. She's obviously under the influence. I don't plan to press charges. I'm the one trying to bail her out, he told the site. You're not trying that hard. You're not trying, yeah. yeah. It, it's not hard to walk into a police station and write a check or give them your credit card. Yeah. Uh, Takashi was released from prison in 2020 after serving time for racketeering and other raps. Not literally raps. He he doesn't rap all that often. So. I had no idea who he was until he got arrested. And then all the thing came out. Now there's some documentaries out there on him. And I'm just like, I'm this guy's a punk. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. We have some of our listeners are fans of Takashi 619. I'm sorry. I just he's a punk. He, he, he's kind of a waste of space. Uh, she probably slugged him for a good reason. Yeah, you probably had it coming. Uh, animal crime. And oh, not, okay. a, not against animals. It's the animals committing the crime. Uh, this is like last week when we had the chimpanzee calling 911. Yeah, or the yeah. Uh, the seal that broke into the house. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we both decided he just wanted to take a shower and watch TV, have yeah. a cup of coffee. This time it's a little more violent. <laughs> okay. If you're ready for this, an elephant rips a handler in half in Thailand. After, Ouch. Yeah, I know, right? After working in extreme heat. Uh, in the elephant's defense, the guy's name was Peanut. Oh, that's true. Well, there you go. That's, that's <laughs> what it would be. Uh, Thai police said hot weather may have made the animal go crazy. Uh, and then he punched a higher floor. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, prompting it. To, <laughs> it's a prince joke. Uh, prompting it to tear Supachai. 
Supachai, Wong Fed, and half. That must be the trainer. Yeah, that's Sup- Peanut. Supachai Wong Fed. <laughs> Supachai Wong Fed, otherwise known as Peanut, and half. <laughs> An elephant ripped its handler in half with its tusks in southern Thailand in half, in, er, in half, yes, last week, after being made to carry wood in the hot weather, according to a report. The body of 32-year-old Supa, uh, Supachai, it's, it, the, long, the, the, the name keeps getting longer the more I read it. It's Peanut. It's called Peanut. <laughs> of 32-year-old Peanut, uh, 32-year-old Supachai Wongfied. Uh, was found in a pool of blood after police responded to a rubber plantation in the Phang Na province. Thailand news outlet, the tiger, spelled T-H-A-I, because they're punny that way. (laughs) The tiger reported. Uh, Police said that a male 20-year-old elephant named Pom Pam, he probably hated his name too, that's why he tore him in half. Yeah. Uh, stabbed the man with its tusks multiple times, tearing his body in half. Oh, that had to be a painful death. Yeah. Yeah. That does not sound pleasurable at all. I, I was picturing like he stepped on him, grabbed him with a trunk and pulled, but no, nope. this is even worse. He's just like, rrr, rrr. <laughs> he just took a run at him <laughs> multiple times and just kept poking him with the tusks. Oh. Meanwhile, Fleetwood Max playing Tusk in the background. And the Kevin uh, Smith movie Tusk is playing on a DVD player somewhere. See, there you go. Uh, we uh, got pro- puns all day. We do. We have lots of puns. We're very punny. Uh, a preliminary investigation determined that Supachai <laughs> just seems like it should be some <laughs> black exploitation flick, you know? Yeah. Supachai. Uh, and it's about tea. <laughs> Uh, brought the elephant to haul wood at the plantation that morning, the outlet reported, citing police. Uh, police said the hot weather may have made the animal go crazy and punch a high floor and then attack the man. Uh, livestock officers had to sedate the elephant with a dart from over 1,600 feet away because they wanted to be safe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what happened to that guy? He did what? <laughs> okay, keep the pen closed. We'll, we'll we'll get it from here. Can you see him in Thailand going closer, closer? <laughs> no, farther away, farther away, farther away, farther away. I think we can hit him from here. Farther away. <laughs> what What's the maximum range in that dart gun? 1,600 feet? Awesome. <laughs> 1,610 feet. March off 1,600. <laughs> Uh, so they hit him with a dart from over 1,600 feet away so that Supachai's body could be recovered. <laughs> well, the elephant probably was like, this is mine now. I own this. My toy. Uh, another incident occurred last month in the Nakhon Sri Tanmerit province. Police suspect that the elephant in that case was stressed from work, stabbed its handler to death, and stood over his corpse for hours. Well, yeah, he wanted to form a union. <laughs> the elephant union. We want breaks. You know what they say about the elephant union? What's that? When you go to negotiate, yeah, you never win because they never forget the terms. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad dad joke right there. It is a horrible bad dad joke. Yeah. I got one for you. What's that? Have you ever, uh, or what was it? Oh, uh, you heard about how they're testing out camo camouflage nail polish and elephants right How's they're putting that? them in trees it's working you know that right no you ever seen an elephant in a tree oh god <laughs> duncan mcnair ceo of the charity <laughs> save the asian elephants i don't know why we need to save them they're killing us yeah i, I was gonna hit the boom boom but i don't think i have it up that's what she said <laughs> god i don't even have the there we go there we go. That's what she said. There we there go. You go. Uh, yeah. Duncan McNair, CEO of Save the Asian Elephants. Save them. We can hardly rescue them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. I just got a message. Delta MSP is using Rody to deliver your bag. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You're late on that one. Duncan. Me meet my elephant. <laughs> <laughs> when you get here, my elephant will be here to greet you. 
<laughs> uh, Duncan McNair, CEO of the charity Save the Asian Elephants, told Newsweek that Asian elephants suffer psychologically. Yes, they do. Is it, uh, yeah, I know. They do suffer. Z- Ziggy, on, let me see. Ziggy, they do suffer. They, they're, they're horribly, horribly psychologically just wrecked. They are. She, you know what? She, she's like, you know, I feel for those elephants, and I'm like, I don't psychologically rack you. <laughs> I know Ziggy's You're... like, trust me, I've been forced to work in the hot sun. I mean, <laughs> I had to go fetch that that ball a couple of times. <laughs> uh, no, she, so that's our latest thing with her is I'm trying to teach her fetch. Mm-hmm. I'll throw the ball, she'll run to the ball, and then run back to me, but leave the ball. Oh, that's what she's complaining about. Yeah, I see. Hmm. Uh, Asian elephants suffer psychologically and physically when broken and forced to work in extreme activities like logging. I almost read jogging because we were talking about going and getting a ball. Uh, It is yet another stark reminder that Asian elephants are and always remain wild animals and can attack and kill when they're abused or overly stressed by humans, McNair said. Despite the practice of using Asian elephants to carry logs being banned in Thailand in 1989, it still occurs in some parts of the country, according to the outlet. So there you go. Okay. So our next story, Bruiser, is the whole reason why I stress when I did radio in Iowa, why I was worried for myself the entire time. Yeah. It's just got a whole different vibe. Okay. I really feared for my safety. Well, it was in Why? Iowa. In Iowa? Oh yeah. The the part of Iowa is I was in, and I won't I won't say where it was, but um I always felt like it had that X Files feel. Like okay. every, everybody's yeah. looking at you like with one hive mind. Oh yeah. Children of the corn type thing. Yes, exactly. That look. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um so And this is why. This is why I always had that fear. Um, An Iowa man is accused of murdering a woman and then placing her head on a stick in a park. What? (laughs) Was he warning other people or something? (laughs) I I think it was. Yeah, I think it was just it was a message. He was sending a message. He was to the kids that play at that park. (laughs) Yes. Get off the slide. (laughs) It's mine. My park. You people should get off my swing set. Uh, an Iowa woman, uh, an Iowa woman who disappeared in April of 2021, was found murdered in a park months later. Ooh. Mm-hmm. An Iowa man was arrested for first degree murder for allegedly killing a woman in April of 2021, then placing her head on a stick in a park because you know fair season. Yeah. Yeah. Come get your woman on a stick. Uh, 23-year-old Nathan James Gilmore was taken into custody on Friday in relation to the death of 29-year-old Angela Nicole Bradbury. Uh, detectives alleged, alleged alleged that he referenced the murder in a social media message and drew a satanic goat's head in the shape of a pentagram. Oh, well, that's oh. a good clue. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, I think this guy's a good suspect. Uh, he did it also with numbers that alluded to the brutal slaying, according to a criminal complaint. Gilmore told police that he picked a woman up who matched Bradbury's description from, I believe it's Cerro Gordon County Jail on April 6th of 2021. He initially said that he dropped her off at a home in Mason City, but later allegedly changed stories and said he dropped her off five blocks from the jail. The teenager, or a teenager rather, found the skull at Greenbelt River Trail Park on July 12th of 2021, roughly three months after the murder took place. Bradbury was reported missing in February of this year by her family, who said they hadn't heard from her since April of 2021. The Iowa State Medical Examiner's Office was able to identify the skull as belonging to Bradbury using DNA and dental records provided by her family about a week after she was reported missing. Additional human remains belonging to Bradbury were discovered at the uh, trail in April of 2021. A medical examiner determined that her manner of death was a homicide. After Gilmore said he left Bradbury on April 6th of 2021, he told police that he went to work, then he returned home that evening. Detectives alleged in the complaint that GPS coordinates place him in the park. 
GPS records obtained from Gilmore's Facebook account showed that on the evening of April 6, 2021, Gilmore's Facebook account was active in an area northwest of Greenbelt River Trail Park at approximately 7.21 p.m. and active in an area southeast of the Greenbelt River Trail Park at approximately 8.37 p.m. Gilmore later allegedly threatened in a message to a friend of his ex-girlfriend that the man would be looking like the body they found outside Mitchell. <laughs> nice guy. That This guy sounds like a party. Yeah. Goes uh, to a prison, picks a woman up, murders her, Yeah, threatens an ex. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, detectives searched Gilmore's home on Friday and found a drawing that depicted a satanic goat's head in the shape of a pentagram with what appeared to be blood splatters drawn on it. Gosh, what a, what a gentleman. This guy's a winner. Yeah. Numbers that were written on the drawing allegedly referred to Bradbury's death. Detectives believe that 04-06 coincided with April 6th, the day Bradbury was murdered. The numbers 43.3 dash 92.8 are allegedly abbreviated GPS coordinates of the park. Uh, Gilmore is being held on $1 million bond at the Mitchell County Jail. It wasn't immediately clear if he had an attorney who could speak on his behalf. He's definitely a stupid criminal. He left them GPS coordinates of where to go. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. 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 If you're going to commit a crime, first of all, leave your phone at home because mm-hmm. they can track you. Mm-hmm. And second of all, don't leave GPS coordinates of the park that you're going to leave the body in. Yeah, yeah, bad idea. <laughs> Definitely bad idea. He fits the stupid criminals. Yes, he does. Uh, we go to Florida, where, of course, there's no real smart criminals in Florida, but we'll give it a shot. Let's see. A man installed a hidden camera in a Florida beach bathroom. No, not a smart criminal. No. No. A man has been busted for allegedly installing a hidden camera inside a public beach bathroom on Sanibel Island in Florida and recording people with it. What is it with people who install cameras in bathrooms? I don't know. It it blows my mind, especially like public bathrooms or like weird places. Yeah. Uh, 58-year-old Dana Allen Caruso of New Hampshire was collared at the Chicago O'Hare International Airport and is awaiting extradition to Lee County, Florida. Reports say the camera was discovered after a Sanibel maintenance worker noticed what looked like a suspicious new fire alarm in the bathroom on (laughs) July 28th. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. Uh, He should have have probably taken the old one down. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Uh, Sanibel cops obtained a search warrant to probe the contents of the alarm and discovered a camera inside. They later somehow tied the device to Caruso and tracked him down in Chicago on August 19th. Cops said several people were recorded inside the bathroom and are asking anyone else who went to Bowman's Beach to contact them in case they were victimized. We would like to identify victims of the crime so additional charges against the suspect can be considered. Uh, Sanibel Police Chief William Dalton said Dalton urged police departments in nearby communities to check their beach restrooms for similar devices. <laughs> so, in other words, go around and pull the fire alarm at every single bathroom you see and see if it's exactly. Real. Yeah, that should if be you, productive. If you see two fire alarms, one of them's a camera. That's right. One of them's a camera. One of them's not. Let's see which one it is. <laughs> if, if firemen show up when you pull it. It's the wrong one. Yeah, it's it's real. Uh, we go to New York where a mother and daughter have scammed $850,000 in credit card, in credit cards, in credit cards, period, in a, in a con to fund a lavish lifestyle. And guess what? They've been indicted. A Long Island mother and daughter, somehow that figures, they're from yeah. Long Island, uh, have been indicted over more than a decade-long credit card fraud scheme. A decade. They decade got, long. Yeah. In which they allegedly scam banks out of hundreds of thousands of dollars of purchases for designer duds and luxurious vacations. All I got to so say. Scam, they're scamming the banks. Yeah. All I got to okay. say is how do they manage that for a decade? That's what I'm wondering. I, I, I know white collar crimes are harder to prosecute because it's normally just like a, a paper trail. So you have to follow the paper trail. Mm-hmm. We're like like a murder or something you have a body you have evidence there but like if they're stealing money you got to follow the paper trail to to nail it down so that that could be why it takes so long but a decade 
Yeah, a decade. How much how much evidence do you need? I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, her name's Karen and we got her. <laughs> 61 year old Karen Geist and her daughter, 33 year old Alyssa Geist, appeared in Manhattan Supreme Court on Friday and uh, pleaded not guilty in the slew of charges against them, including grand larceny and fraud. This is a 13 year scam or scheme that involved thousands of credit card transactions whereby Karen falsely reported, even though she incurred legitimate charges as fraudulent said assistant direct or district. Oh, that's how they did it. Said assistant district attorney, Catherine McCaw uh, during the hearing. So they would charge and then call them fraudulent. Yeah. Which confuses me because I've had a couple fraudulent charges on my card and it takes forever to get that taken off. Yeah. Like hmm. the investigation that goes into that is crazy. Yeah. Uh, prosecutors allege Karen falsely disputed $850,000 in charges from approximately 14 different credit card companies between 2008 and 2021. Jeez. That's a lot. That is a lot. Uh, these purchases ranged in nature from the luxurious to the mundane, according to District Attorney Alvin Bragg's office. On numerous occasions, Karen's booked travel f both for foreign and domestic to exotic exotic locations, including Paris, Milan, Norway, Costa Rica, Hawaii, and a number of other places. The ADA told Justice Laura Ward in court. Uh, the Huntington resident allegedly received credit on her statements uh, after calling banks and writing letters to employees, falsely reporting fraudulent charges, including $205,000 on her American Express cards and 155000 from Chase. Jeez. That's a lot of dinero. That is. She booked tickets in her own name, car rentals in her family member's name, hotel stays in her own name, and other luxurious purchases like watches and handbags while she was traveling. Uh, she also allegedly disputed mundane life expenses, such as purchases at the dollar store. <laughs> and even Come a, on. Yeah. <laughs> And even a veterinary bill for her dogs, Lewis and Daisy, as well as a shopping spree at the likes of Bloomingdale's and Bergdorf, or Bergdorf Goodman. It's so luxurious, I can't even say the name. <laughs> Bergdorf Goodman. I've never even been there. Uh, prosecutors allege that uh, Karen later recruited her daughter to join in the family racket and that Alyssa took part in the con for approximately six months. In 2016, Barclays Bank uh, uh, obtained surveillance footage of Karen and Alyssa making a transaction at a Chanel store, which the two later reported as a fraudulent charge. Now, that's kind of stupid. You yeah. walk in, make the charge, and then say it's fraudulent. Well, that, that confuses me, too, because she's booking everything under her own name. When someone steals your, uh, your identity, they don't use your name. Right. Or show they, your face. Exactly. Yeah. They don't get caught on camera. Yeah, do it online. Uh, Alyssa, a former New York City teacher, allegedly used one of her mom's credit cards for a $1,400 purchase in July of 2017 and following Karen's specific instructions and disputed the charge to get a refund. Well, <laughs> while traveling to Montreal with friends in August of 2017, Alyssa texted her mom about how to falsely dispute charges as fraudulent. This is according to prosecutors. Mom, could you please teach me how to be a criminal like you? Come on, Mom. <laughs> Come on, do it for me. We'll bond over <laughs> it. It'll be a mother-daughter bonding session. Uh, Alyssa, Alyssa left the Department of Education in 2015. Yes, she worked for the Department of Education. <laughs> in She's teaching our children. <laughs> <laughs> teach your children well. And uh, founded... Is this really the name of the... Oh, my gosh. And funded Tutorology which is a home and online tutoring service for kids. <laughs> I guess they tutor you in how to steal shit. Yeah. Uh, police raided Karen's home about a year ago and found more than 100 credit cards tied to multiple purchases, including a refrigerator and sunglasses, as well as receipts related to transactions that were later reported as fraud, the DA's office said. the accused How good is her credit that she can get 100 credit cards in her name? You've got it. Well, you know what? When you get that many credit cards, you've got to have an 800 score. 
Yeah. Because you keep opening the credit line, and as long as the credit line is paid down, or you pay down one card with another, or you assume the the credit line, if you open a bigger credit line and assume the credit line from the other card, yeah, that card is then paid down, and you keep, and then it has a clear credit line. So you've got one credit line that's that's still open and has less of you know you know what i'm saying so yeah but if it's fraudulent though like you're not paying that so doesn't that affect your credit line no because the credit line from the previous card is transferred over to another card uh okay so they're working and the so, system yeah so then you have two credit lines now you've yeah. you've got a combined credit line like let's say okay let's say i've got two two cards citibank and chase okay yep Let's say the Citibank card is $1,000. The Chase card is $2,000. I've run up $1,000 on the Citibank card, and I get a $2,000 Chase card. I absorb the $1,000 credit line onto the, from the Citibank card onto the Chase, line, or Chase card. Now, I've still got $1,000 on the Citibank that's wide open because yeah. I put it on the Chase card. And now $1,000 of that is on the, on the Chase card. But I've got a thousand dollars open now on both cards. Okay. So I've wiped that debt off. I've now got two thousand dollars open on two cards, and I raised my credit limit. I got gotcha. you. Because now I'm only using a thousand dollars out of three thousand dollars of potential credit. Gotcha. So it actually raises my credit score. Gotcha. Because I gotcha. You're, because you're only using. 33 well you're technically using 33 percent of your credit limit but if i go and open a third card yeah like say i open an amex gold that has no credit limit yeah skyrockets your your uh credit limit or okay. skyrockets your credit score okay so then that's what they did yeah and now they can get anything gotcha yeah now gotcha. you can get anything now the sky's the limit yeah so you got to be careful and, and by the time you get to 800 credit cards you probably, and she's probably saying that her, her income is probably something in the, you know, millions of dollars. So yeah. she's able to get black cards and she's able to get things like that. Right. Her credit limit's got to be an 800. And they're, they're trusting her with credit limits and credit, credit, credit lines that you and I couldn't even get close to. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and you're not worried about ratios at that time. So she's paying off one card with a credit, you know, transferring a credit line yeah. from another card. And she's just paying off cards one after the other after the other. So and she, then when they're all built up, that's when she starts claiming the fraudulent stuff. Yeah, and exactly. Starts get, gotcha. Yep. So when, gotcha. They get, when they get built up, oh, I didn't charge that. Yeah. And then she fights it. Yeah. So she just plays a shell game with a bunch of cards. And then when they start to get built up, oh, I didn't charge it. Gotcha. Yeah. See? For a decade. Jeez. For a decade. Right. Takes a certain kind of person, man. That it does. Uh, the accused con artists were freed on supervised release following their hearing on Friday, and their passports were ordered confiscated because when you got credit cards, you can travel. <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> Alyssa, who was or who wore ragged jeans and a printed top, was in tears when she left court, and both she and her uh, mom declined to comment. My only comment is she's not guilty. <laughs> she's <laughs> no, completely doesn't work that way. <laughs> she's completely innocent here, and it will come out in the end. Said Alyssa's attorney, James Pascarella, a lawyer for Karen, did not immediately return a request for comment. The mom and daughter are back due in court on September fourteenth. And they're going to go away for a very long time. Yeah, exactly. Um, you ever wanted to own one of uh, Tom Brady's Super Bowl rings? No, because I heard about the guy that bought a Tom Brady, the football, the last football he had, then he retired, bought it for a couple million dollars, and then he retired. Now it's not worth anything. Yeah, it's true. Because <laughs> he unretired. Mm-hmm. Well, a New Jersey man has been sentenced to three years in prison for supposedly selling "quote unquote" Brady Super Bowl rings. Well, yeah, it was B R A D I, but still, <laughs> but still, it was a Brady. A <laughs> uh, New Jersey man who posed as a New England Patriots player to buy and sell three Super Bowl rings engraved with Tom Brady's last name was sentenced to three years in prison on Monday uh, for the scheme. 
Scott V. Spina Jr., who's only 25 years old, will have to pay $63,000 in restitution to a former Patriots player that he built by buying the athlete's Super Bowl. Which one is L.I.? Is that 51? Yes. All right. Super Bowl 51 ring uh, with a phony check in 2017. Uh, that, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, the memorabilia huckster later sold the band for $63,000 to a noted broker of championship NFL rings. That, according to the feds, uh, when Spina purchased that piece, uh, he also received information about how the ex-New England athlete could buy replica Super Bowl rings for family and friends that were slightly smaller than those awarded to players. The swindler then called the ring company, posing as the former player, and bought three family and friends Super Bowl 51 bands engraved with the name Brady. (laughs) He's my (laughs) brother-in-law. My brother-in-law wants to get these. Really? Uh, Which he falsely represented uh, were gifts for the baby of quarterback Tom Brady. (laughs) You got to be shitting me. Uh, Tom Brady doesn't have babies. His kids are older. He kisses them. Right on the lips. Maybe, maybe they're uh, baby mama babies that uh, Giselle doesn't know about. <laughs> uh, the rings were at no time authorized by Tom Brady. Defendant Spina uh, intended to obtain the three rings by fraud and sell them at a substantial profit, federal prosecutors said. The Rosalind resident sold the jewelry at an auction house for $100,000. One of the rings sold at auction for $337,219. Jeez. That's a nice pull right there. I know sports memorabilia is a big racket for for fraud. Yeah. That's why you always want to get a COA with it. That's right. Yep. Uh, Spina pled guilty to one count of mail fraud, three counts of wire fraud, one count of aggravated identity theft back in February. Jeez. That's a nice living right there, I'll tell you what. Yeah. I don't care if you get caught or what. I mean, it, if you spent the money, you spent the money. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, we were talking earlier about sexual assault and rape. Well, let's talk about a, a good story having to do with that crime. Are you ready for this? Okay. Turns out that Grandpa's a hero. Oh, okay. Good for Grandpa. What do you do? Some grandpas out there are some tough sons of bitches. And I they know a lot of grandpas that are tough sons of bitches. And they know a crime when they see it. <laughs> and they're crime stoppers. So we're going to applaud one grandpa out there who stopped the rape of a five-year-old girl and punched a some bitch and attacker. Yes. Yeah. Give this guy a medal. That's right. It says here there's a graphic content warning, but we don't give a shit. We're going to read it. I say it with with a swear word, and that's why. The grandfather of a five-year-old girl punched his daughter's fiancé after discovering him molesting the child, according to police in Middletown, Pennsylvania. He's lucky he only punched him. That's right. I would have probably gone a little more graphic. I would have used more than my fists. I'd have sawed his nuts off. That that would have been me. Oh yeah, uh, the you, grand- you're hurting my family, my blood. You're yeah, you're getting. That's right. It's lucky yeah. he didn't kill him. That's yeah, yeah. And then you know what? I give that grandfather a lot of credit for the restraint to just punch the guy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the grandfather walked past his granddaughter's bedroom on August 24th and saw her sitting on the lap of 22 year old Aaron Coonigan, uh, which he thought was weird. That's in quotes though initially thinking nothing more of it, this according to court documents. When he noticed the girl's bedroom remained too quiet, again in quotes, he returned to investigate and discovered Coonigan in the corner of the room between the bed and the crib, exposing himself to the five-year-old girl who also had her pants down. The documents further explained. The grandfather then intervened, pushing his daughter's fiancé before yelling and calling the Middletown Borough Police Department, who arrived shortly afterwards and arrested Coonigan. The incident woke up a woman in the apartment who said that Coonigan told her uh, he had blacked out during the incident and he was sorry. Yeah, you dumb mother. It doesn't work. Yeah. Nope. Again, I give this grandfather all praise in the world for, for holding back and just punching the guy. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's out. It's coming off. That's right. 
Uh, he had first reportedly told police that his pants had fallen accidentally when he stood up. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Hasn't, yeah, that goes along the lines of like, oh, I didn't cheat on you. I slipped in my penis filler. Yeah, that hasn't yeah. happened since Charlie Chaplin, I'm afraid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your and pants Charlie just, Chaplin didn't touch a five-year-old. That's right. Uh, maybe a 13-year-old, but not a five-year-old. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole different thing. Uh, but later admitted that he pulled them down when he felt numb after the girl pulled hers down. Come on, dude. What? Yeah. What is that even? What is pulling? Oh, okay, yeah. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it was just going through my head. If how does that say? It was just going through my head. If should really do it or not, he said to authorities, according to the affidavit, which noted that the girl claimed similar incidents occurred five times before, which Coonigan denied. So this wasn't the first time he'd done this. Yeah. So what happened those other times? Your leg goes numb again. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Piece of garbage. Yep. Kundigan was charged with rape of a child, indecent assault, unlawful contact with a minor, corruption of minors, and indecent exposure, according to an August 25th news release from the police. Kundigan was arraigned on August 24th and sent to the Dauphin County Correctional Center and was unable to post $150,000 bail, $150, bail. I say bury him under the jail. Uh, his preliminary hearing is scheduled for September 7th. Hopefully an inmate gets a hold of him and does exactly what he's done to that little girl. So, oh, they will. Yeah. Trust me. They, they. If you, if it's, if you're in prison and it comes out you're a pedophile, it, it's not good. It's slow mo on the chomo from there. Yeah. yeah. My dad, my dad, um, which I've said numerous times, is a correctional officer, and he says that he's put many pedophiles in protective custody, and it, it's that internal moral battle you have with yourself, like should I put this guy here because he needs protection or because of what he did? Yeah. Should I turn my back? You know, and, and my dad said that was the hardest thing he ever had to do. Cause it's, you know, morally you just want this guy to get the, you know, let them do what they will. Yeah. But by law, you know, he has to have his day in court and all that crap. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the guards would sometimes accidentally leak out information. That's the conundrum right there. Uh, just a couple more stories here left on Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals, three to be exact. A vegan mother is sentenced to life over her toddler's death. Turns out Sheila O'Leary was convicted on charges, including first-degree murder. A vegan woman convicted of murder in the malnutrition death of her young son was sentenced on Monday to life in prison. Uh, 38-year-old Sheila O'Leary, whose family found a strict, or followed rather, a strict vegan diet was convicted in June on six charges, first degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter, child abuse, and two counts of child neglect in the death of Ezra O'Leary. This according to the AP, her sentencing in Lee County, Florida had previously been postponed four times. Her husband, Ryan Patrick O'Leary remains in jail while awaiting trial on the same charges. Investigators said the couple told them the family ate only raw fruits and vegetables, although the toddler also was fed breast milk. The 18-month-old boy weighed 17 pounds and was the oh, size geez. of a 7-month-old baby when he died in September of 2019. you got to feed your kids. Yeah. Like, it's so, I, I don't, I have nothing against lifestyles like that, but your child needs certain things to survive. Give your child those certain things. Yes, yeah. You know, I don't care if you're organic or whatever. You can get organic baby food. You, I'm sure they make vegan baby food, but like feed your child. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, a police. Uh, OK, so the Cape Coral couple uh, had two other children, ages three and five, who were also malnourished. Investigator said a fourth child was returned to her biological father during an earlier malnutrition case in Virginia. Uh, O'Leary, who earlier rejected a 30 year plea offer. The plea deal offered by the state was ordered to have no contact with the children. Good. That's disturbing. She probably doesn't think she did anything wrong. No. Because she's vegan. No, that's the thing. I mean, that yeah. uh, again, that, you know, that's, she probably thinks, well, I was following the lifestyle I believe is right for me. So why shouldn't it be right for my children? Exactly. And it's, it's not that it's not right for them. It's just you have to adjust it because you're a full grown adult. You have to adjust for a child. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and that's 
what's good for you isn't necessarily what's good for a growing child and you have to you have to just use some I, I you know I say just use some common sense but it feels like that's been thrown out in this day there's no common sense in that yeah 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 no it's it's we're we're this style our kids will be this style and we don't care what it costs and again, you can still have your child raised in that style, but you have to learn the nutritional facts of how they can get everything in because they're still growing. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, two Air France pilots. By the way, plane horror stories. The worst of all. <laughs> this is the only thing that didn't happen this weekend to either one of us while we were traveling this weekend. Okay. All right. Are you ready for yeah. this? Yeah. Two Air France pilots are suspended over a mid-flight fight in a cockpit <laughs> this is the only thing that could have happened this weekend wasn't it last week we talked about two french pilots that took a nap yes they're either <laughs> these two are like one of them's like i'm tired you can't go to sleep but i'm tired you can't go to sleep they're, <laughs> they're either napping fighting fucking or or drinking <laughs> yeah it's one of those things but they're not flying which is come what's on, french pilots <laughs> come on french pilots let's get it together here it was a case of fight or flight. See what I did there? Yeah, I did. Uh, two Air France pilots have been suspended after they exchanged blows, <laughs> and not like that, in the uh, cockpit during a fight from Geneva to Paris in June. An airline official said Sunday uh, the plane had just taken off from the Swiss city when the pilot and co-pilot got into an argument that led to one of them throwing a punch and the two grabbing at each other's collars. Well, that's <laughs> like <laughs> the planes is doing loop de loops as it's going along. <laughs> little collar and elbow tie up there uh, <laughs> by the two pilots. It's, it's gentlemanly, I guess. Um, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the cabin crew was forced to intervene, and one member stayed in the cockpit to babysit the pair for the remainder of the approximately one hour and 15 minute flight to the French capital. Uh, the midair brawl didn't affect the rest of the flight, and the plane landed safely, To according to an airline rep, uh, spokesman for the airline, who called the behavior of the since-grounded pilots totally inappropriate. Uh, I'd be worried about, uh, you know, when you get off the plane, the pilots usually standing up there by the head stewardess and, yeah, sorry, head flight attendant, and they're saying goodbye to you. Yeah. <laughs> you walk up and they got a black guy, bloody nose. Yeah. His shirt's just ripped wide open. Teeth missing. <laughs> goodbye, yeah. everybody. Oh, uh, wee wee. <laughs> Bonjour. Um, a, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, the suspension comes amid heightened scrutiny of the Paris-based Paris carrier over safety concerns. France's Air Investigation Agency, BEA, released a report last week which included, or concluded rather, that the airline's pilots have fostered a culture of not following safety procedures by the book. The report centered on a December 2020 flight from Brazzaville in the Republic of the Congo to Paris when the crew rerouted the plane to Chad and landed after discovering a fuel leak but didn't cut the engine or land as soon as possible per leak safety procedures, which could have resulted in the engine catching fire. What is going on, France? Just a small, <laughs> small oversight. Yeah. Uh, Air France said that it is conducting a safety audit in response to the report and promised to act in accordance with the agency's recommendations. That includes allowing pilots to study the flights after completing a journey and designing stricter training manuals when it comes to following procedures. Here, here I, I can start their training. Uh, don't fall asleep. Uh, don't punch each other. <laughs> And if you have flammable fluid in your engine, turn it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Land as soon as you can. It's probably a good idea. I mean, probably. Yeah. 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 And we're not pilots. No. no, we're just, We probably could be at this point for Air France. <laughs> well, the way America's going lately, uh, if you can just sort of fly a plane, you're in. <laughs> yeah. They need pilots, so. Finally, on Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals today, a Florida man has been arrested for calling a sex worker on his honeymoon. Uh, Evidently. I'm assuming the sex worker wasn't his wife. Yep, it's not. Evidently, if the wife ain't putting out, somebody else will. It's their honeymoon. <laughs> they haven't even been married that long. <laughs> well, if you got a headache, somebody else doesn't. I guess. Just saying, you know, honey... I hate to put you on a short leash here. Hate to put you on a pitch count, but you know, 
if you can't put out, <laughs> we got somebody else who will. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about their marriage when he's willing to spend money to get sex? Like, what does it say about their sex life? It says the wallet comes open pretty easily. <laughs> That's what it says. It says you should never be afraid to ask for cash. I hope I hope at the end of the story it, it goes with, well, honey, I bought her for you. Oh, maybe. <laughs> See? It wasn't for me. It was for you. Yeah, yeah, hoping that you two could get into it, and then here I come in and slide in, like, see? Yeah, I hear a little, here I come to save the day. <laughs> He's very Mighty Mouse, yeah. Uh, a Florida man was arrested on his honeymoon after he answered an ad for a prostitute, according to a local report. I didn't know prostitutes put ads out. <laughs> I, they do in Vegas, but I didn't know they do, did it in Florida. That's right, those little clicky cards when you're walking past, and they yeah. click, 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 click. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, 34-year-old Paul Tarofsky, who looks very, very skeevy, uh, left his new bride sleeping in their hotel room in Tampa and went out to meet a prostitute he had connected with online. Aw, that's, that's so... That's romance, I guess? Skeevy. No, I was going to say It's skeevy. very skeevy. Yeah. Uh, when the self-employed businessman arrived at the Hyatt Hotel. He was placed in handcuffs, uh, not kinkily, but just by a cop. Yeah. Uh, caught up in a sting operation by local police to crack down on sex trafficking. The only question here was, as a wedding guest, was it too late to get the gifts that they <laughs> gave returned back to them, said Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Cronister, uh, adding that Tarofsky was one of the 176 men arrested in the sting operation. Ouch. So 100, a lot of men. 176 men answered the call, so to speak. But it was his honeymoon. Like, that's the thing that's blowing me away. Yeah. Like, he hasn't even yeah. been married long enough to complain that there's no sex in the marriage. It's their honeymoon. <laughs> what do you tell the wife when, uh, when you got to make that phone call? You don't call her. You don't? No, you call somebody else. No. You hide it. Yeah. You're in Tampa, though. I mean, who's going to come down to Tampa? What is on his chin? Uh, probably a little bit. Is of, it just gray, gray hair in that one spot? It's either gray hair or one of the prisoners had to uh, <laughs> unload on him after being titillated by an online prostitute. He looks skeevy as, yeah. Yeah, he's skeevy, isn't he? You know what? You know why he has that face, too? Because that's before he had to make the call to his new wife. That That's what it is. He's thinking, yeah. oh, I got to call the wife? No. Well, what does he tell her? Like, oh, baby, I was just online checking my, my emails because, you know, I, I got a business to run and you were sleeping and, oh, I was wanting you so bad and I just couldn't resist. And she was, she was, it was a siren call from online. She, she looks just like you, baby. She looks just like you. I was like, oh, I want you so bad, but I don't want to wake you up. And I, I'm such a considerate lover. I'm still with the whole, but I bought her for us. Yeah, I was going to introduce her, and we were going to have this really sexy threesome yeah. where where I brought her in, and I woke you up, and then you smacked me so hard I fell through the window. <laughs> and then the two of you could get it on. I just see him getting out of jail, and there's an attorney. Oh, where's my wife? Oh, no, she's not your wife anymore, sir. You've been served. <laughs> yeah. Here's your papers. You've been served. Uh, find your own way home. Yep. No. Oh, by the way, she changed all the locks in the house. Yeah, it's not your house anymore either. No. And that car you used to drive, that's not yours either. No. Nope. Oh, and that independent business you have, well, guess what? She owns half that. Yeah, so good luck to you, buddy, Mr. Trump. Oh, and guess what? You still didn't get to meet with a prostitute because you got arrested. <laughs> yeah, so learn how to jerk it in the corner. Yeah. There's and that, other things online that can get you off. And that other guy and not, there. And not the, get you in trouble with the police. That's right. And that other guy there in the corner, he wants to toss your salad. So, you know, <laughs> should be an interesting night, though, for you. Yeah. And you won't Enjoy. have to pay him. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. So I think that'll do it, Bruiser. That's uh, right. Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals for this week. Tomorrow's show, it is uh, Supernatural News. Interestingly enough, one of the stories we're going to talk about on tomorrow's show. Yeah. Uh, I got to ask you, were you a Van Halen fan? I was. Were you? Uh, I, I was. And then uh, my father-in-law made me even more of a Van Halen fan because he was obviously one. But uh, he was, he loved Wolfgang. He called him Wolfie. Wolfie. Yeah, Wolfie. 
I actually yeah. have a guitar pick from Wolfie. Do you? I do. Yeah, he he was in love with Wolf. He just thought it was so cool. His name was Wolfgang. He kept calling him Wolfie. Yep. So that made me an even bigger fan of Van Halen. And it was hard to listen to Van Halen after he passed. I have to admit, it took me about a year yeah. before I could listen to, to Van Halen again. Yep. Uh, I, I I was I'm I still am a diehard Van Halen fan. I in fact I would swing the camera around. There's a I have a huge canvas of Eddie Van Halen. Uh, behind me over my left shoulder of uh, Eddie playing Eruption. Yeah. Um, uh, I've uh, been listening That's to... That's Wolfie's dad, isn't it? Eddie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I have a huge canvas of Eddie uh, here. It's a black and white canvas in my studio. Um, I'll have to send you a picture. One of my favorite bands is Tool. Yeah. And there is <laughs> there is a picture of a fan uh, at the Tool concert asking to have his picture taken in front of the stage. Oh, I've heard was, that story. It yeah, was Eddie yeah. Van Halen taking the picture. So then there's yep. a guy taking a picture of Eddie Van Halen taking the picture of the guy. Yep. And the guy had no clue who Eddie Van Halen is. It, it was Eddie and Wolfgang. <laughs> they were just there. That's one, the, the no that's one of Wolfgang's That's one of Wolfgang's favorite. I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's one of Wolfgang's <laughs> favorite stories. Yeah. About his dad. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess Maynard calls the guy out later on. Yeah. Like on stage. And yeah. Maynard's not a crowd interacting guy, but he calls this guy out. Like, well, how do you not know a legend? Like, <laughs> yeah. How do you not know who Eddie Van Halen is? Right. Yeah. And then they went backstage, didn't they, afterwards? Yeah. After, yeah, yeah. They went back, and that's when Wolfie went and told Maynard about it. And that's when Maynard, it was right in between their encore, and then Maynard came out in the encore and called the guy, yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. You over there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Eddie had no problem taking the picture. He thought it was no. cool. Yeah. Eddie was there to enjoy Tool. Yeah. He was like, hey, I'm good friends with them. Adam Jones is another great guitarist. And yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the, uh, one of the more touching stories about Eddie Van Halen is, is him taking the original Frankenstein guitar. Not really the original Frankenstein, but the, the Bumblebee guitar, not, not Frankenstein, but the Bumblebee guitar, the black and yellow guitar. Yep, and putting it in Dimebag Daryl's uh, casket when Dimebag Daryl oh, died. Oh yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, that was that was a real touching. Um, yeah, there's a picture moment. somewhere of him in the casket with that, and then all the Crown Royal and and yeah, the, so they used to do the black tooth grin shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a lot of things Eddie did um, during his life that a lot of people didn't know about. You know, um, but there's a there's a story on tomorrow's show that uh, is kind of shocking, and I'm surprised there's so much blowback from the Van Halen Nation about it. Okay. And it has to do with the fact that Sammy Hagar has come out and said that he believes he's had a dream visitation from Eddie Van Halen. And Makes that, sense. And that Eddie came to him and said, let's write a song. And okay. that he wrote a song with Eddie, but it is not on the new Sammy Hagar and the Circle album. He's holding it back and that he's just going to release it as a single. Okay. I can't wait to hear the story. That'll be good. So yeah, we'll have that. We'll have that uh, story on tomorrow's show on tomorrow's supernatural news. Um, people think it's a, a money grab. The, the negative people in Van Halen nation, that I think are David Lee Roth fans are, are thinking it's a money grab by Sammy. I, I don't think so. You know, Sammy's had a lot of, and someday I hope to get him on the show uh, to talk about, his UFO experiences, his supernatural experiences. He's had a lot of ghost experiences, a lot of UFO experiences. I was going to say, Corey Taylor tells a story about him and Sammy doing an investigation together. Yeah. Because Corey Taylor, Slipknot's a huge paranormal yep. person. Yep. And he, he's told a story about how Sammy Hagar approached him about it. Yep. So yeah. I, I think when, when Sammy talks about it, he's genuine. I agree. I truly do believe he believes that he had that experience. Okay. So we've got that story for you tomorrow. We've got lots of other supernatural news tidbits for you with uh, myself and Bruiser. Uh, Bruiser, what you got going on this weekend? I am in Dunlap, Tennessee for Square One Pro Wrestling, and I'm going to take Mrs. Bruiser with me, and we are going to make a Labor Day weekend adventure out of it. We're going to explore, uh, I think we're going to probably Dolly Land or whatever that is, Dolly Parton's little theme Oh, park yeah, Dollywood. Park. Dollywood or Gatlinburg or something, but we just, we figured, you know what? We haven't really gone out 
so I'm bringing her with me to the show, and we're going to make a long weekend of it. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. 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 Going to earn those points. Yeah. Um, let's see. Minnesota State Fair is going on this weekend. You know what? You know who I've always wanted to see who I've never seen? Who? Diana Ross. Oh, okay. She's and playing, huh? She's at the Minnesota State Fair this weekend. I might just um, pull a dumb crime and be a stupid criminal and get some money together <laughs> and go see Diana Ross. I mean, how, how often do you get to see a legend? You don't. You don't. Do it. Do it. Yeah. So I may go see Diana Ross this weekend. All right. All yeah. Right. I, it's, a, it's just something I've had on the top of my head for a while. Next week, you have to tell me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to be back in time to do uh, the little dumb crime, stupid criminals? Or are you going to be? Yeah, yeah, because she's got to work on Tuesday. So Okay. All right. So I'll be back in time to record. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, because we got to get her back because she still has a, a job. She still has to listen to you. <laughs> she's fantastic. A, I'm, I'm not going to. I, I joke about my, my Mrs. Bruiser, but she... She was a full-time mom, full-time wife, graduated, full-time student, graduated college with honors, got her degree, got this great job, and she's been amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's why That's why I got to reward her every once in a while. That's right. Kudos to her. <laughs> she keeps the house going, man. I'm telling yeah. you. So that we can goof off. wedding anniversary, and I've said it in the post, she's been my nurse, my best friend, my, my rock, my warden, everything, and, and She's amazing. So she is indeed. She is she's indeed. sticking Dollywood, and I'm gonna go with it. But I'm a big fan of Dolly Parton. Who isn't? Yeah, yeah, exactly. How can you not love Dolly Parton? You can't. She's the epitome of strong female. Yeah, strong, classy, intelligent, funny, beautiful, beautiful, yeah, funny, beautiful. hilarious, very oh, hilarious. Yeah. yeah, incredibly funny. Faithful to her husband of all these years. Yeah, I mean, just an amazing woman. Yeah, she is. That she is. Well, you two have a fun time this weekend in Tennessee. Yep. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, Supernatural News. Uh, I believe on f- on Friday. Listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to do a new show on Friday. It's got nothing to do with nothing. Um, no, on Thursday of this week, uh, we have a couple of gentlemen that will be joining us. And we are going to talk about UFOs and UFO abductions. All right. Yeah, if you've seen the movie Haunted on Netflix. I haven't yet, but I will. I will check it out. Okay, that it's uh, our guests have a little something to do with that. George Sewell and Dan Baldwin are going to be on the program. And uh, we'll talk UFO abduction. We'll talk about one particular person, Lindsay Higgins, and her UFO abduction from childhood through the present time and how it's affected her. So that's going to be on Thursday's program. All right. Yeah, so that's kind of what we have in store for the rest of the week here on Darkness Radio. Again, we're so happy, folks, that you've you've joined us and can you continue to be with us uh, throughout the weeks here on Darkness Radio. You have no idea how much Bruiser and I appreciate you. By the way, um, we want you to continue to follow us and continue to uh, be uh, patronizing our sponsors. We want to thank Babel for being with us this week. Yes, I've been using mine. I've been learning. Yeah, so we want to thank you for using Babbel uh, and uh, and trying Babbel. And, and, you know, we know that you all have um, you have motivations for using Babbel and, and wanting to learn new language. Bruiser and I are both learning a new language. I have my motivation for wanting to learn French, and uh, you're learning Spanish, correct? I am. Yeah. I am, and it's helping a lot. There you go. So... Uh, so, folks, yeah, try these new sponsors because we're, we believe in these sponsors. We want to uh, we want to get sponsors to you that we believe in, that we we are having fun with, and we want you to have some fun with them as well. And they believe in us, and they're putting their hard-earned money where their mouth is, and uh, want to uh, support our show as well as much as you want to support our show. So, we encourage you to try them, uh, folks. We'll see you tomorrow for Darkness Radio for Beer City Bruiser. I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us for the best in true crime podcasting this has been true crime tuesday and join us tomorrow for the best in paranormal podcasting darkness radio